Tuesday, July 5th, 2020, here in the uh, uh, Edward Steele room. Um, we have an agenda before us. Uh, can someone approve the agenda or if any additions we need to be made? Uh, I'll move to approve the agenda as presented. Do we have a second? Yeah. Second. Second. Okay. Before that, I just want to uh, add a brief item and we can put it at the very end. It's just um, a item about should we invite a, a guest. We've discussed it before from the uh, Worcester Select Board on cell towers. And we could just have probably a you know, under five minute discussion on that if, if, if we want to invite you. You want to put that in before the manager's items or after? You could put that at the very end. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. We have a oh, I'll move to accept the uh, addition to the agenda. Thank you. Does the second still stay in place? Danny? Thank yes, you. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Okay, next item is the consent agenda. Uh, the only item on the consent agenda are the minutes of the June 20th meeting. We have a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Thank you. And seconded. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? There being none, motion passes. Now is the time when we move to uh, where we can have discussion from the public. Uh, someone can make a brief comment. We usually like it to be two minutes or under. Uh, and it should be something that's not on one of the warned of agenda items. So if anyone has uh, something to say for me, Hi. you can um, step forward and Jenny and Garber, say your name. Um, I live on Twin Peaks right? Road. Sorry, just for the Zoom. Yeah, if you could come forward. Just, if folks don't mind, mostly because we have Danny in virtual space, and this way the owl head will turn right. to you. And if you don't mind, just saying your name for the record, it helps okay. say we know it's the kind of weird. Of technology. Seven. Uh, Jenny Garber, I live you, on Twin Peaks Road. And the only thing I came to mention was the survey that was on Front Porch Forum uh, listing priorities that um, we were asking people to uh, put, you know, the most important to you and then on down. And I've talked to a couple of other people too, but there was one of the things, and I put it down at the very bottom where you could put in a note, that there was nothing in there about trying to conserve our natural resources in the town. There was nothing very, there was nothing obvious about that. And with, I think with climate change, and I think we, over the years, we're going to get more people moving north. And I also know that we need to get more affordable housing in the area. I just kind of feel like that could be lost and not considered in the development of all these things in the town. So I don't know if anything can be done about that survey at this point. Um, but it would be nice to include something like that because we've got a lot of other groups in town that are interested in trails and they're interested in the reservoir and you know all these sorts of things so I think there's a lot of other people um, that are interested in that too. Thank you. Duly noted you, you could always have add things on to you know it won't be maybe on the official because again the, 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 the surveys are kind of out but put things on front porch forum put things you know <coughs> put it you know, letters to the editor to the uh, Waterbury Reader Roundabout, and if there's an overwhelming, you know, groundswell for that, that would be something that would definitely be considered. There's been quite a bit of chatter on Front Porch Forum about it. I'm not sure if you were the first one who put it on, but 
<clears throat> shortly after the survey went out, somebody on Front Porch Forum did state that there was nothing about conservation, and there's been several people all over the past yeah. week or so that have kind of jumped on that bandwagon. So I, I think I think it's clearly something the public is interested in. Yeah, and I think that's and just to follow up if you don't mind, Mike. Um, those are great outlets as well, but that Jenny is exactly why we had that other button there, and so we're really appreciative that so many folks did use that. Um, and then just as a reminder, because I know, I don't know if there's other folks in the room or on Zoom or, or even just we'll be watching later. This is, the survey was to put a couple of items in the town profile as we work to hire a new town manager, just so they could see kind of an overview of some of the priorities that, that you know, the town is looking towards. And that is not to minimize conservation as a priority. Absolutely, it's it's on there. Um, but this, but that is not an exhaustive list, and it is not a list that's setting in stone what the priorities of the future municipal manager or select board is. It's just to give them an idea of some of the things that the town and EFUD together have as priorities in the coming couple of years. So just to give a little clarification, and also thank you so much for, um, for bringing that up again. Okay. Thank you, Danny. Well said. Thank you. It's been mentioned several times about it, but nobody's really taking the ball and run with it, and it's long overdue. Well, they might put something on the Waterbury Record. I, I did see things in front porch form, and I think a lot of people do. They're like me; they probably skim through it, you know, and pretty frequently. But it's just something to keep in mind, um, so that the the new manager realizes that there are a lot of people in town that that's important to them too. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your addition. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any any other comments? I have Go ahead. It's okay. okay. You can come forward and state your name and. Good evening, everyone. Okay. So, my name is Maggie Karen. I live in Waterbury. I just want to share some thoughts with you recently, a recent event. So, I want to title Election Integrity and Just and Fair Elections Begin with the Signs at the Edge of the Road. And as both the town chair for the Waterbury Republican Committee and also the chair of the Washington County Republican Committee, I'd like to bring an area of concern to your attention. Yesterday, while I was taking a walk in my neighborhood, which is right near here, I noticed that some candidate signs seem to have been removed and tucked behind a cement wall near the side of the road, which is right down there at the train track over the road. Um, this occurred near the roundabout where numerous other signs still stand. Those signs that were taken down still lay there tonight. I would actually invite all of you when you're leaving to just go take a look. They're right behind that little cement where your transportation vehicles come through. I understand that on occasion transportation and public works staff might remove some signs for being too near the roadway. But to me it seems quite unlikely that the only signs that would have been too close to the roadway would belong to a conservative candidate and that all the other signs would be said to be more appropriately placed. During the recent town meeting election, I know that other conservative candidate signs were also removed and or pulled down from the locations that they'd been placed in several areas. So I want to talk to you today as town select board about your dedication and commitment to just and fair elections and to election integrity. I want to talk to you about what this community really stands for and who and what Waterbury is really all about. And that answer, in my opinion, starts with town leadership. So I ask each of you, are you concerned about these actions? Are you willing to take any actions to monitor and correct the situation? For example, if your road crew or anyone else is asked to remove signs uh, for official town reasons, perhaps they could report them to the administration so that you can know why and where, you know, so that um, we can know if and why they were taken down by town staff. And I want to know if it concerns you at all that not all candidates may have been given equal opportunity to show our Waterbury citizens who's running for state and federal seats this November and who they have the opportunity to support and vote for. It saddens me that the community that I moved into about 13 years ago has become so divisive. And it saddens me that efforts to interfere with local, state, and federal elections seem to be becoming the norm in our area. I'm reaching out to experts regarding this type of behavior, and I've also spoken to the Vermont State Police to see what might be able to be done about this. I'll be speaking to other professionals regarding this matter also in the very near future. I won't presume, presume to know who's doing this, but someone is. So I'm here asking you today, do you care? And what, if anything, are you willing and able to do about it? 
I believe in the opportunity for just and fair elections, do you? So I would just like to go back to that basic question about what if any, well first of all, do you care? And I'm hoping that that would be a affirmative from everyone. But what are you able and willing to do regarding this concern? Because we're just getting started in this election season. And so before the board answers, uh, your custom board, just a couple of clarif clarifying points. I'm, I don't believe the town staff has taken any signs down of late. Uh, you need to know Vermont state law prohibits signs in the highway right of way. Oh, so I didn't know that. if they're in the highway right of way, we, t we try to take them all down. Mm -hmm. uh, signs that go up in the roundabout, we absolutely try to take them all down because they can block lines of sight. Um, <coughs> signs that are on the grass strips along Main Street, if they're between the sidewalk and the street, we try to take those down. Mm -hmm. um, the highway right of way generally extends often onto what is perceived to be someone's <coughs> front lawn. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're behind the sidewalk, we, even though they may be in the town highway right of way, we respect that as private property, even though it technically is the right of way. So we try to leave them up if they're behind the sidewalk. Um, the welcome to Waterbury sign, which is just off the roundabout, is presently owned by the Edward Fry Utility District. We're in the process of transferring that over to the town. That's really outside the highway right of way. We typically encourage people who want to put signs up that can be seen from the road to put them up there. So with that, just understand, if they're in the highway right of way, mm -hmm we will probably take them down. Um, and I say this a bit tongue in cheek. Nobody really that works for us enjoys having to take signs down. So unless they're told to take them down, mm -hmm. I don't think they're being taken down by the town. No, no, I'm not suggesting mm -hmm. that you're saying they are. I'm just saying that um, <coughs> I, I'm not suggesting that, the, that they don't have initiative, but mm -hmm. taking signs down is not their highest priority. So. If they're told by Bill Woodruff or myself to take them down, they will. If I see signs in the roundabout, I typically walk over and take them down and bring them back here. They're put on the front porch. People can come and pick them up. We don't throw them away until after the election mm -hmm. because they do cost money, but we do try to obey what the law says. And let me clarify that. I was in no way implying no, that your town staff, but I, I guess I was asking if your town staff is removing them, could you somehow keep a record of whose are removed and perhaps why or where, so that when there is a question about some that are removed that we might feel shouldn't have been, we would at least know if the town staff had done it. If not, then we would be looking at it. Well, um, if the board wants to direct me to keep track of when and where, I guess I will. From my perspective, if they're in the town highway right away, they're taken down. I, I don't think we need to keep records of that. You just put them on the porch out front. If people's signs are missing, you can look there and take any of them that you want, because ultimately, in the end, they go in the lane. So, but that's where they're from. Thanks, Bill, for that clarification. I would encourage first uh, any of the board members to comment. And, and we do, I mean, and Carla can attest to this. We do get people that call here very upset because there is someone's sign, whether it's a left-wing person or a right-wing person, doesn't matter, that there's a sign and somebody's putting it up and it looks like it's on my lawn and our response typically is, well, if it's in the highway right of way, especially between the sidewalk and the, and the street, uh, we'll take it down. If you live on Twin Peaks Road or on Neyland Flats, there's often no sidewalks, and if they're alongside the road and they're three or four feet outside the road, even though that's the highway right of way, we're not going to take them down. If somebody complains and says they're in the right of way, then we have to go look, and if they are, we'll remove them. But we try to respect the fact that, you know, most people, if there's no sidewalk, they mow up to the edge of the road, and they take care of that is as if it's their property, and if they want to put a sign up, it's okay. So 
we're not completely, you know, um, it's not the law of the Medes and Persians that we're out there measuring every inch of the right of way, and this is in and that's out. But, so anyway, we do get complaints from time to time, and most of the time we tell people that people have the right to put signs up on their property. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I, I think this space that I'm coming from is, you know, experiencing the town meeting election and what happened to specific signs during that procedure, and now looking at it already this early in our election for the primary in November. I just wanted to come in and address it. I would like to think that we would share the concern, uh, regardless of where you stand politically, that we all want everyone to have an equal opportunity to be known and to be seen and to be heard. And so I just wanted to come and lay that at your feet, and um, if there's anything at all that you can do um, to help with this, that would be great. And over the 34 years that I've been here, the, the sign thieves have come from both sides of the spectrum. It used to be a big problem the other way 20 years ago. So. Yeah, and again, I'm, I'm not finger pointing at all. I just no, can I tell you, it. you know, it, it definitely has become pretty clear since March that it is, um, that, that's my concern. So, all right, I will leave you with that. Thank you very okay. much. Uh, I was just going to say yes, uh, in answer to your question, uh, yes, we are concerned. Uh, thank you for bringing this to our attention. I think we're all in favor of a free and fair election, and as long as the signs are being put up uh, within the regulations, uh, we'd like them to remain there as long as they are appropriately uh, displayed. Uh, I don't really know the, the particulars of, of the situation, but uh, in answer to your question, we are concerned, and we'll try to do what we can to that they're respected. Any other comments? Well, there is truth to what she brings to the table because surprisingly enough, it's happened to me several times. <laughs> uh, and I've had other people call me that have had a, other candidates' signs in their yard outside of the village, outside of any of this area here uh, that would be more prone to rights of way. Um, It's unfortunate that we've come to that, but like he says, apparently 20 years ago it was the same thing. So there, it's always happened. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm not so it, but you can, politics. you know, they get taken down, they get trampled down. Mm -hmm. You're asked to put another one up, that gets taken. Um, right. So it, it's it's happening. Uh, there's no there's no doubt that it's happening. And, we also appreciate it when the election is over if people can take their signs down. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Chris. We have a couple of hands up, Mike. Okay. Uh, Kelly was first. Okay. Kelly? Hi, thank you very much. Good evening. How are you? Can you speak up a little bit? Sure. Um, oh, let me just check my audio. I'm sorry. There, is that better? Yeah, much better. Okay, sorry about that. I am always um, on mute for the school board, so um, that was the issue. Uh, so good, good evening. How are you? Um, thank you for your time. My name's Kelly Hackett, and I'm the vice chair of the HUUSD -U school board. Um, and we would like to share with the community that Dr. Mike Likeletter has officially begun his tenure as the superintendent for Harwood School District. Um, the school board is holding uh, a variety of uh, three actually meet and greets in the community for Dr. Mike and his wife, Mary Edith. Um, and those will be held on Thursday, uh, July 14th at the Waterbury Farmers Market from 4 to 7 p.m. Wednesday, August 17th at the Warren Town Hall from 5 p.m. to 7.30 and Saturday, September 10th, uh, tentatively planned at the Waitsfield Farmer's Market from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. So we were just hoping to get that um, information out to the community and um, if you could have it in your minutes, that would be great. Um, our first official school board meeting will be on August 31st at Harwood. Thank you, Kelly. Linda? My name is Linda Gravel. I am the vice chair of the Democratic Party in Waterbury, along with the Justice of the Peace for Waterbury. 
the D Democratic Party uh, comes to my house to pick up signs, lawn signs, and when they arrive, I tell them they must follow the according rules of the town of where they can put them, and they are not to touch any of the other parties of any of the other parties' signs. So that is our, our uh, take on uh, lawn signs. We would not like our lawn signs to be touched either, so I can understand where the other party is coming from, and we will respect their signs. Thank you. I would like to say thank you to her. Just her. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, I just want to say one brief comment. I will send a letter to the editor of the paper and urging people because one, I believe in very free and fair elections. I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat, progressive, whatever, you know, everyone has a right. As much as I'm kind of anti-lawn sign, I don't like them, <laughs> I, I wish we would ban them, but I know it's First Amendment rights that we keep them, but I think you're probably having a few hooligans who just, you know, that's what the issue is. But I will ask and make a plea of the citizenry to respect the each side, you know, because it can happen. You know, when one starts taking down other signs, it's going to happen the other way. Yeah, and again, I wouldn't finger point at anyone, but obviously right. it's happening, so someone must be doing it. But I'm not pointing at a party or any group or anything. I just wanted to come in and, and basically ask exactly that: Is there any manner at all in which you can address it to the to the community? We are a community, and we just respect each other, and you know. I think that's the best way of a letter to the editor. It concerns me, but I don't know what, you know, again, as Bill said, it's happened for years. Mm -hmm. It may not ever stop, but, you know. We can put a good voice to it, though. Right, we could, we could put a voice to it. It's, it's not a cool thing to do, stealing any party signs. Yeah. And, and I really do appreciate, I can't see her name, but um, I really do appreciate Linda the alliance Linda in this, Gravel. yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. Bring, bringing that to our attention. And, and just, uh, I was one of the candidates that had uh, signs that were stolen this last go round, um, and having paid for them myself, exactly. they're very costly. So, you know, I like to look at the glass half full and figure out it must be a threat, otherwise they wouldn't steal the signs. But, or maybe they wanted it as a poster or something, but they are costly. So it'd be <laughs> nice if you put something in there and say, you know, they, they do cost a lot of money. Yeah, so, aren't they like, they're like $10, $12 a piece now? Yeah. People. Uh, Parkinson, there are a lot more. Um. <laughs> yes. Anything else? If not, we're going to move, move on to the next agenda item. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's another. Oh, oh. oh. on a top, not, not related. No, it's a new subject. A new subject is out okay? Yeah, you can bring. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi. Thank you Hi. all for your time um, commitment. So I'm Jill and Sackett. I live on Ring Road in Waterbury. Did you say your name again? Sorry, Jill. Sackett, S-A-C-K-E-T-T. -T. And I just want to echo um, a little bit more into the, uh, the survey, and I know we sort of talked about it, but there's a lot of us out there that really are concerned that conservation wasn't addressed. Um, because although I understand that was, you guys were doing just a skinny dip <laughs> into, the, into the possible waters, if that does not remain an issue that is in the front of our consciousness, it will be an issue that is literally fig and figuratively trampled on. So I think that we, um, moving forward, it, it, it would be for everybody's benefit in this community if we could all recognize the importance of conservation and keep it in the forefront at all times. So in that survey, the fact that there were eight questions, eight possible answers, I apologize, I, I feel that that was a serious omission. Um, and not, not a slight omission. So again, I think unless we keep something like this in the forefront of our, of our conscious, it will be trampled. And um, our, this is a beautiful community, and one of the most beautiful parts of it is all this beautiful land. And I think everyone can easily agree to that it's part of why you are here. Um, and I would imagine that all of you, when you go back and visualize childhood memories, a lot of those are outdoor amongst all of this beauty. So I want you to just pay that forward for the generations that are coming and keep that, um, that, that memory, that beautiful memory forward for my children, for everyone's children. 
Um, and that is really, I guess, the main thing that I want to say. And I appreciate your listening. So. Thank you, Jill. I appreciate you voicing that. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Anything, Billy? It's Billy Vigdor. Um, so now that the uh, survey has, has come up, and I don't have any agreement of my colleagues at the Conservation Commission, but we have been working for the last few months to uh, create, to do what we're supposed to do by our bylaws, which is create an inventory of the town's recreation, natural, cultural, historic resources. Why we got that broad mandate, I don't know, but that's what we have. And we've been working on actually taking a more formal process. We're not going to start inventory trees. We've agreed not to do that. We also, we also are struggling with kind of the scope of the inventory because we don't think it should just be conservation, how to conserve. The idea I think of, and this is my, my thinking only, is conservation comes with a series of trade-offs. The town will have its community values. It will have a lot of values. We have to worry about housing, economic development, inclusion and conservation all needs to be met together so we're working on trying to figure out how to prepare a comprehensive well established survey to that end what we've done is we're trying to we're in the education process so we've invited uh, fish and wildlife to come in and they have a program where they teach conservation commissions how to do some of these surveys so one i wanted to let you know we're doing that and i know that linda gilpin's talked to bill about us being less siloed and maybe other committees of the town being less siloed. This is my first brick or board coming out of the silo. So I wanted to tell you about that. Um, and that's what we're working on. The other is just a plea for help for anybody who cares about conservation or the survey inventory. We could use resources and people to help. Um, I put things out on front porch forum, but we could really use some resources when it comes to that. So I wanted to let you know we're working on that. It doesn't address this particular, as to this particular survey, what I hope you consider though is people who went to the effort to write in, to appear, that's kind of like double, triple voting. I'm hoping that in the profile that comes out is we have a, a, like you guys, and like Bill, we have basically a manager who sees conservation as a piece of the puzzle here. Thank you, Billy. You know, I think, I would like to say one more thing here before we're done with this topic is, I think a large part of this conversation this conversation is, is um, I think that we're leaving out is large tracts of property owned by private individuals and how that, what's, what's at stake there and the future of where that land is going and, and what are the current owners planning to do with that property? Because that's one of the number one underlining problems that I see with the degradation of a community that, and its open landscape, is the inability for anybody to tell what somebody else can do with their property. Um, you know, fortunately, and I, I mentioned this somewhere, and I, I don't know if it was at a prior select board meeting, but right now the benefit that Waterbury has is we have certain fairly well off people that have large tracts of land that are wanting to keep that open. What's gonna happen in the future when those people are gone? You know, there's yeah. there's their their children and, and so on. And you know, if, whether that should be a focus of part of this issue and how we can lock that up. Uh, Chris, did you say it's problematic that there's an inability to tell people what they can do with their property? No, one of the problems, don't misunderstand me, okay? Well, I'm, what I'm trying, trying to understand. Uh, I'm trying, what I'm trying to say is that through many different reasons, one being overtaxation, two being people are dying off like certain people I know and I won't mention them that and then once they die off the property starts to get chopped up and and for children of people with own large tracts of land not wanting to stay here or it's 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 an asset to them that they used for the retirement you know how can how can a town any town 
try to make use of those opportunities if there were some uh, to preserve that property. I know a, a farm here in town that the adjacent landowners are scared to death that this farm will go under and that it will become housing and there's been an effort to try to connect the farmer and these people together because they have the wherewithal to, you know, conserve, conserve that. Yeah. And uh, to me, it's more the fear of that current use goes away. If current use goes away and there's not that the large track tax break. Well, current use has some problems too. So so yeah, as far I as understand I'm that. But current use, if it disappears, you'll see a lot of change in hands of property. But the unfortunate part is the, con the conservation committees have like zero money to work with. You're right. Well, um, so I'm not a board member, and if I'm out in front of my skis here, I have testified before the Development Review Board at least three to four times asking them to take a look. When we did the municipal plan, Part of the Worcester Range was designated not only as bear habitat, but unfragmented forests that needed to be carefully considered before we develop it. Um, whatever happens in the room outside the public meeting, it's hard to tell how they come to their decisions. The ones that I'm familiar with have no reasoned decision as to how they've decided that it's okay to build a road or to build a property or, or whatever. Um, I've given up there. But I think the tools the board has here that I know of is A, zoning regulations, and what the Conservation Commission did uh, was we proposed to the Planning Commission um, a priority wildlife corridor where not only would shoots fill, but we would have a town discussion of what else needed to be conserved, which would have a heightened level of scrutiny before we would um, build on that. Number two, and I think Mike, you and I spoke about it, mm -hmm. who goes on the development review board is important. If you have builders, architects, and real estate developers on a development review board, <clears throat> you're probably not going to get a lot of effort in terms of digging into the facts and saying, is this an area that we think needs to be conserved? Do we need to limit the housing, modify, or whatever? I don't think we should take people's housing rights away, but zoning regulation is the only tool I know of in town. I think some of that is on all of us to think more about. Isn't that this? Isn't that a basically a, a process of the same thing? I mean, shoulda, coulda, woulda, but the Worcester Range should have been maybe 25 acre zoning at one point. Um, but the horse is out of the corral on that one. Um, Alyssa. To go maybe full circle, thank you, Billy, for the comments. I just want to emphasize, because there was folks interested, Conservation Commission, you can hang out every week and do this with Billy, and just to say, at least personally, when we had this select board survey, and I shared this response to some folks who emailed, but to Steve, just to emphasize, you came back to the zoning, and I proposed the idea of my top priority in the next one to two years is to update our zoning bylaws. Um, the parameters we were given is what is an actual item in the next one to two years. So speaking for myself, the framing said housing and economic development, and I do regret not including the word conservation, but in my mind, the priority of creating some forward progress on a zoning rewrite that I personally have been involved in for four years and trying to get something over the finish line, even if it is for the downtown to create more density where we're already developed, is an important actionable step we can do. So that was my personal feeling of conservation in a top priority item for a survey. Um, but I think this idea of not being siloed is really important. So that's the other thing I think for us to think about how do we have not a conservation planning commission development review board and select board all talking about different things that we're all moving in one direction. Thank you. It Bye. might it might be something that we may want to have the conservation commission again to our or to a select board meeting. Well, I think we're going to be around because this inventory is something we're working right. on, mm -hmm. but we'll need to talk to you about that. Could we uh, hear what Bill has to say? Yeah, and as everyone knows, I have six months and to go and, and not trying to um, tick people off in the next six months is a big goal of mine. And I hope nobody here from the Conservation Commission or the people who have expressed this concern take offense to what I'm going to say. 
Um, I'm the municipal manager. I kind of see everything as people and organizations come in and out. They ask for funding. They want to talk to the select board. Um, I was just trying to count. I think, I think probably in the last 10 years, there's been six people who've called me up in December and said, I'm the new treasurer of the Conservation Commission. And, and you know, what, what is this budget process? And I explained to them, I, we put a budget together. Um, the Conservation Commission hasn't come close to spending its budget in I don't know how long. Um, you know, there's $700, only $700, that's in the Planning Commission's budget every year to go to the Conservation Commission. And the Conservation Commission, you know, last year got its $700 and spent $245. And I know there's a pandemic and everything else, but if you go back in time, you'll see $700 in, very little spending. There's been talk about, um, you know, having speakers come in, and is there money to pay in our area, is there money to buy refreshments, you can do what you want with your money, and, and nothing happens. And it's, it's a little frustrating to me in that uh, in this survey, I guess the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and until the survey happened, I don't think anybody on the Conservation Commission has been in here waving the flag too much. Maybe you've been to the Planning Commission, and I know you, Billy, and I, I, I'm sure you've been to the Development Review Board. And I'm not trying to say that nothing is being done, but I might be the only one in the room who remembers when the Conservation Commission was started. And I don't remember the year it was started, but I know um, Karen Miller was on the board, and I, I know that because just of conversations that we've had. But when the Conservation Commission was started, the point was made by the select board at the time, and I was like, okay, that's what you want to do, but you're going to have a Conservation Commission, but we're not going to spend any money to conserve, any public money to conserve property, to conserve land. You have to kind of go out. So we give them $700 a year to do a little bit of programming, and they're supposed to do everything else. And if conservation is important, uh, you know, I look at page 28 29 of the annual report, and, you know, there's fifty-seven, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year that goes out for Circo, Good Beginnings, Down Street Housing, Children's Room, Senior Center, all worthy causes. But if we can afford $60,000 for all of those outside organizations, couldn't we afford a little more than $700 and, and actually do something with the Conservation Commission? It kind of sits there and it's, it's impotent. It doesn't have, it has no authority and it has no money to even do anything with. So if you're going to make this a priority, I think you should. And, you know, the large tracts of land, and, and again, I have mixed feelings about this. Because we're in Waterbury, 60% of Waterbury is in state forest land that can't be developed ever. And people complain about their taxes. And we have 40% of our land that we can tax. And the state owns a whole bunch of it, and we get a good pilot payment from them. You know, the forest land, we get, I'm, I'm happy, I mean, I'm telling the select board in my report today, well, we'll probably get more than $9,600, I mean $96,000 from the state this year for the state forest land. And we're going to get $107,000 for the, the pilot from Forest and Parks for, you know, outbuildings and lean tours that they have. And we're going to get $380,000 from the state, all of which is probably 60% what we would get if those same properties were owned by the public. So, I'm not against conserving land, but in Waterbury, we, we have a lot of land. Maybe it's not the right land. You know, that's, that's maybe where the rub is. You know, the fragmented forests, the, the wildlife corridors and everything else. But we have a lot of conserved land in Waterbury already. And um, that land is, and property is, 
is where our revenues come from. So I know I said a lot. I hope I didn't offend anybody. But if the Conservation Commission wants to do something, maybe they've got to be given a little bit more money to do something with. And maybe there needs to be a, some kind of strategic planning about what role the Conservation Commission has. Because every time somebody talks to me, it's just about, well, can we have a speaker? We're going to rent the Green Mountain Club, and somebody's going to come in, and they're going to talk about whatever, the landslide that happened up in uh, the state park land. So I'm not being critical of you folks. I'm just trying to say it's time to do something with my well, I'm just going to say guilty as charged, because I've been on the commission for three or four years, and it's we don't have a big mission. We don't, we don't have, you know, if someone wants to do, that was why I comment to the DOB by myself, because one, it moves too quickly for the commission to move, and then, you know, to have everybody edit everything I write will take three months. <laughs> that's all said and done. I mean, it took us six months to make the comments, yeah, uh, you know, so yeah. that's, that's government, right? Uh, but I, I think it's, I, I would just say, I think some of the onus on us is because it has been a loosely managed group, appropriately, I don't want to criticize anybody, done basically on what individuals wanted to do. And our last big effort was helping on Shootsville, on the, the radio or the, or the tower. And things have kind of lost momentum. And that's why we did the strategic planning to say, let's do the inventory and let's figure out what the tower wants. Nine of us in a room are not going to dictate. So I, I agree with you. And I probably shouldn't be responding. But. Just a quick <laughs> comment. I know as a former chair of the Conservation Commission, and I, I, I think I was on the Conservation Commission, I was a founding member, probably there for seven years. The problem was, I know when I was there, we founded the Con Conservation Fund. Mm -hmm. I always said, and we had people in the conservation wanted town money to go in every year. I said, I was opposed to that. I said, if we have a good project, the Conservation Commission should come to the town yeah. and ask for money from the town. If you don't have a thing, I don't want to ask taxpayers who are hurting already. And I think that's where you're at. If you have a good project, as Bill kind of says, ask for money. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. That was more than my two minutes, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank that. you. We, we appreciate that perspective, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Thanks. Uh, if there's no further, uh, we are already behind on the agenda. We're going to move forward. If other people do have comments, we'd be glad to have you at the next um, uh, select board meeting. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to select board items. With, uh, uh, update from the library director. Hi. Thank you for having me. For those who don't know me, I'm Rachel Muse, the director of the Waterbury Public Library. Uh, I know you have a lot on your agenda, so I'm going to try to make this relatively quick. I do have a handout for you. I won't read through the whole thing, so this way you can take a look at uh, my notes. Uh, but the reason why I wanted to come here today is because we've reached kind of an interesting milestone at the library, which is that we have uh, now, uh, as of June 16th, been uh, fully reopened for a solid year since our pandemic closures, uh, which feels really good. <laughs> it's really nice to be back up to speed. That means we're back to being open uh, 46 hours a week. And uh, we were open uh, 2,380 hours total in the past 12 months, which is almost double what we were open the 12 months before that. Uh, so that is uh, very nice to see. Uh, again, I'm not going to read through all these statistics, but I do want to point out that we welcomed 351 new uh, card members in the past year. And one of the things that's been really interesting about that is so many of those people have come into the building and said, oh, we moved to Waterbury a year ago, but we haven't been able to be in this building. We didn't, we didn't know if there was a library. We didn't know anything about it. So it's nice to, to be welcoming people who are relative newcomers, but hadn't found a, a way to be in the library before that. Um, we are very busy these days at the library, uh, but um, there are some interesting takeaways uh, that I want to talk about that have happened since the pandemic. If you look at the, the back side of your handout, um, you will see a very strange looking chart at the top there, uh, which is actually kind of uh, Waterbury's pandemic in lines. <laughs> um, the orange line represents our print book usage and circulation. Uh, starting in September of 2019, and the blue line represents our digital book usage. Um, you can see that that blue line spiked up 
and what right as the library closed uh, in March of 2020 and has stayed relatively stable ever since, well, that print book usage line has really been all over the place with a very nice spike last summer, which was sort of our kind of brief era of normalcy. Uh, but I found this to be kind of an interesting uh, statistic to look at to see how uh, what Waterbury has looked like in the past few years. We are slowly creeping back up to normal, and I hope we'll be getting there in the coming months. I have high hopes that this summer will be a, a really good and more like normal summer for us. The next chart is a uh, kind of interesting thing for me to look at was um, uh, I was looking at a lot of different numbers at the library, but one that I found really interesting was computer usage. So this means people who come into the library and sit down at a public computer for long stretches of time uh, to get work done, to access the internet, to do things like that. And that number has very slowly and steadily been creeping up all this year, which says to me that there are people who are still coming back into the building for the first time after a long time away. Uh, so I just, I pulled these numbers out of a lot of different statistics that I could have shown you because I thought they really showed us something interesting about library usage, which is that uh, we are still creeping back up to normalcy um, after a very erratic couple of years. Um, so what are we up to at the library right now? Uh, lots of programming. Programming is back in a big way. And one thing that's really interesting about what we're doing with programming that uh, I think is actually a silver lining of the pandemic is that we can offer programming in so many different ways. We do a lot more uh, virtual programming. Uh, some of our programs have, people have chosen to stay on uh, virtual programming for things like certain book clubs, uh, for our chair yoga, other programs that uh, maybe target an older audience who don't yet feel comfortable, maybe necessarily coming out to a public space, but they do want to access those library services. Uh, we are working on more and more and better hybrid programming where we can have people available on Zoom uh, as well as in the building and we uh, are recording a lot more of our programming than we used to so that we can make programming available after the fact. Uh, we are also taking a lot more advantage of our outdoor spaces uh, and thanks to funds we received through the Department of Libraries uh, through their ARPA funding we were able to purchase things like a PA system, canopies, tables, um, lots of items that make it easier for us to, to move around and to set up a space wherever we need to set up that space. Um, as you saw from one of those charts on the back, our digital book usage went up quite a bit uh, during the pandemic and our closures, and it has stayed steadily high. Even as we see people coming back into the building to get print books, uh, they, are, they are not giving up their digital books. They loved those while well, they had access to them. They learned how to use our systems. Uh, so that's uh, something that we're going to continue to provide at a high level and again thanks to funding we received through the Department of Libraries we've been able to really supplement our digital book collection. Our friends of the library are also paying for a, ser a service called Press Reader which allows us to provide access to digital magazines and newspapers to the public. So we're definitely going to be providing access to more digital materials uh, going forward. Um, and then I... <coughs> What we're really enjoying this summer is just that feeling of getting back to normal. And I think folks who, if you have had young kids go through the school system, you know that the uh, summer reading program at the library is a very big deal. <laughs> um, this year, we've, we're really trying to make that uh, feel celebratory in a lot of ways. So we actually kicked off our summer reading program tonight with uh, a presentation from VINS, the Vermont Institute of Natural Sciences. So we have... Uh, just leaving the library now, a tortoise and a falcon <laughs> who uh, were here to teach kids about um, watershed. And we talked a lot about conservation, but uh, actually that's a huge part of the theme of our summer reading is watershed management. Um, but one thing we're trying to do this year is expand our summer reading to, um, to teens and to adults as well. So I'm also going to give you a handout, which is our summer reading bingo. Uh, for adults in the community to challenge themselves to do some reading in the summer and to read a little bit differently. <coughs> we do have some prizes that you can win if you do this. So uh, so that's one way we're, we're really trying to um, not just focus on the kids this summer, but to really expand our uh, program to uh, people of all ages. So I'd encourage you to take part in the summer reading if you get a chance. Um, and uh, if you uh, want to, yeah, grab another one, they're great. Um, and this is something that we hope that we'll see uh, going forward. Uh, but the biggest thing that's happening right now is that we are um, launching a strategic planning initiative. Just heard some talk about strategic planning. 
Um, we are going to launch a survey on August 15th that was gonna, we're gonna access the community in a lot of different ways, uh, including, of course, we're gonna have it on our website, but we're also gonna bring paper copies out to the farmer's market, get that survey out, lots of paper copies available right at the library. Uh, and then in the fall, we'll be convening focus groups to like really get into more of the details of that survey. When I started at the library almost a year ago, uh, I was excited to read what the strategic plan for the library was and discovered that the last strategic plan had uh, been written before this building was built. Uh, so the great work clearly was done to get that building into place, but it's time to, to really take a look and think, okay, well now that we've got the building, what are, we, what are we doing with it? What are our priorities for the future? So the goal um, this late summer into the fall is going to be to spend a lot of time talking to the community, figuring out what they want to see out of that space and what, what their priorities are and how those have shifted uh, since the pandemic, since we've definitely seen usage change in some ways, um, including a lot more digital services and uh, a lot of use of our small meeting rooms as more and more people live lives on Zoom. Um, so that's my quick report as to what's going on at the library. When I'm convening those focus groups, I'll definitely reach out to you because I'd love to hear from you and if you are available to take part in, in some of those meetings, we'd love to talk to the select board about what they'd like to see from the library. Uh, any questions? Just a real quick question. In your digital numbers, does that include digital music as well as print? No, this is just, just, um, just books print. and oh. audio books. Yep, so not, mu not music okay, not or any... streaming video. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your computer usage, uh, do you have some people that are perhaps overusing and, and maybe crowding out people that want to use? No, I think we're, we're in really good shape, actually. Good. Um, and we offer computer usage in a lot of different ways, and, and that's actually been another thing that's changed since the pandemic. So not only do we have the, the standing public computers that you're used to seeing there that people come and sit down at, we have a couple of Chromebooks that can circulate, and those have become very popular because there are people who don't necessarily want to be in the building all the time, or they're, they're doing something out in the world and they need a computer. Um, and uh, our Wi-Fi gets a ton of use even I'll, I'll arrive at nine in the morning and people will be <laughs> sitting in the parking lot using the Wi-Fi. So, uh, so I think that we're able to provide access to computers in a lot of different ways than we had been previously. Is uh, 3,000 books per month uh, what you consider uh, a norm or is there? Yeah, that's been, that's been about the norm, but as you can see from the, the numbers on the back, it's really jumped up and down. We are crawling back up to 3,000. Last summer, we were, we were well back up over that. Um, I think we are going to get there this summer. I, I do feel that usage picking up already. Um, but it has been just, it's been really interesting to see how you can actually see sort of the waves of cases yeah, I mean, this is all due to the COVID Yeah, pandemic. it's it's kind of fascinating to, to see that visual in the way people have actually been using the library. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Rachel. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming in. Hey, next item on the agenda is a Makersphere request to paint electrical boxes to represent. Hi. Oh, back, back of me. Um, I'm MK Monley, and I'm actually here with a few different hats on. Um, one, as a former art teacher at Brookside Primary School, uh, two, Makersphere, three, Waterbury Area Anti Racism Coalition. Uh, the common factor in those three hats is community based art. So, um, which I'm passionate about, which you would know with the River of Light Lantern Parade. Um, at any rate, uh, Makersphere had approached Bill a while ago about painting some ele of the electrical boxes. And we had written a grant to do that and we're thinking we would have students paint them and we didn't get the grant and so that sort of went by the wayside. Um, but I'm also part of the public art team on the Anti-Racism Coalition and when I was the art teacher at Brookside, 
we had artists come into school, the first people who were allowed to come in during the pandemic. <laughs> um, and we did this project called Windows and Mirrors, where we were taking perspectives. So it's, you look out a window and you see people, and what are their experiences? They're different than yours, and you look in a mirror and you, you, know, you know what your experiences are. So it was, an, you know, it was a perspective-taking lesson for the kids tied in with art. And what the public art team is thinking, if we can paint the two electrical boxes, and this is all ifs and whats and um, the one at Park Row and Main Street and the one at Stowe Street and Main Street, those students who were at Brookside are now at middle school. I haven't talked to the middle school yet because I need to talk to you folks. But, you know, could students work with one of the artists who worked with them when they were at Brookside to continue the windows and mirrors theme and paint those two electrical boxes? What they would look like, I don't know yet. And we would assume we would have to bring the designs to the board for approval. Um, so it's just an idea to spruce it up a little bit, add some community art, get kids involved. So that's my pitch. So there are a lot more boxes. Um, we went through this a year and a half, two ago. Yeah. And uh, Green Mountain Power doesn't allow their boxes to be painted. But these are, these are the traffic signal boxes. They're big-ish, yeah. like five yeah. feet tall by three yeah. feet wide. The town like owns them? I, I, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we went through that. Green difference. Mountain Power <laughs> just doesn't want their boxes painted for whatever reason. I don't have any pro uh, I would like to see if there's some sort of a, I know you, you Makersphere gets funding from the town as is, you know, if there's some sort of fundraising to provide the ink, the costs right. and stuff like that, if we, we could do it, yes, it would have to be presented and approved, you know, because everything nowadays seems to be controversial, you know. Right. So. Yeah, and we're not asking for funding. We're just asking permission okay. to spruce it up. Folks, what's your opinion? And what? I mean, it's going to cost some money from somebody, right? Uh, yeah. do you, do you so the Anti-Racism Coalition has some money. Mm -hmm. Makersphere has some money. And then if we needed to raise money, we would do that through the community. Right. Mm -hmm. Bake sales, whatever. Yeah, art sales, yeah, cheap art. art. <laughs> right. So it looks like, and the kids are already? Uh, well, no, I haven't talked to the kids yet because I wanted to get permission before I approached the art teacher at the middle school. And, right. you know, so it's like, I need to. One step at a time. Yeah. Any object, Danny, any? comments. It's wonderful. You know, I drive sometimes and see it in other um, communities and it's just so beautiful. So yeah, I, I understand MK got to go through each step. And then I think the whole board would love to see, you know, the pitch um, of what, of what the art might look like, but I think it's wonderful for the town. So thanks for making it happen. Thanks, Danny. Any other comments? Jane's got her hand up. Oops. Jane? Yeah, I'd say that any of you have driven through South Burlington, um, they have community-wide embraced painting their electrical boxes, and they're really interesting. They're all different. <laughs> A lot of them have kind of garden themes, but they're very bright and colorful. They catch your eye. So I think it's a terrific idea. And I think we are uh, very, we are in good hands with uh, MK and her group to come up with a good proposal. Thanks. We were in Saratoga like a month, month and a half ago. And they have all these, at first I didn't know exactly what they wore, but my wife said, those are kind of high heels. And I guess they have a history of dance and they're all different ones painted and they look great all around town. So if 
if there are spaces that are applicable of you know tasteful means and stuff like that i think i don't i don't does anyone have any objections no Can we ask questions just questions from back here what? i don't know if we have <clears throat> ask a question um, i'm just curious you know um i think we're in, in such a sensitive time you come forward right? so the people on the zoom I, I was just thinking, I just think we're in such a sensitive time, and I know uh, I was at several meetings recently about your banner, and I just, it's such a heated thing um, to go in a certain area, and so I guess my question is going to be, is this what we're talking about again, one of these very controversial items, or are we just talking about a, a, a very random, decorative, scenic, all-inclusive, um, all-comfortable-for-everyone kind of piece of art? That's my question. I think we need to see what the students come up with, but the idea would be perspective taking and being open to understanding other people's perspectives and then looking at our own perspective. So it's hard to say, you know, if the kids came up with um, abstract things. They also did self-portraits and looking at themselves. So I, I can't say what it's going to be until we're actually working with students. But whatever designs we would want to paint that we came up with, we would want to bring to the select board before we started painting on the boxes. It wouldn't be anything that we would just do without permission. Any other comments? I have a question. You know, um, Lisa. Do you want to come Could up come to on, the come camera? Up. I really don't want to come up if you don't mind. Oh. Um, I, I love art. Art is extremely subjective. And I think that's what we interject into this conversation, which is what is going to be appropriate to one might not be to another. And we can't please everybody, obviously, when you're in art. You know that. Um, so I would certainly be interested. I think we're putting the board in an uncomfortable position of being able to be the jury uh, for everybody in Waterbury, and this is what we've run into before. Um, you know, this, I don't know what the time frame is to have some sort of a, a painting, you know, but let's say a painting goes up that Waterbury doesn't love, and then we have a student, we're in this awkward position of telling a student that you know, we've had a public outcry. We have people that aren't happy about it. Um, it could go the other way, and everybody could be really happy, and that's great. But, uh, you know, we've got so many things that we're juggling right now that I just think it's, it's really putting the board in an awkward position to have to, to be the judge as to what is going to subjectively make people happy throughout all of Waterbury. Um, if it were going to be gardens and flowers and all of that, I'm all for it, right? It's very, very neutral. But there just seems to be the potential here to end up in another quagmire. And because what's the... Because you're saying that this is about a child's perspective of something and, a, you know, perspective we're leaning into again because you're saying you're from Wark, which is a wonderful group and it's anti-racist and I think that's terrific. But, you know, if a child comes up and decides to put words on it that they want to put on it. Or, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, we don't know what's going to come out of the child of the mind. But <coughs> if it comes out and that child wants to do that, who's going to be the one to go and say, that's really not going to work? You know? I, think, I think we just need to be very careful what we're putting in our community because we're asking everyone to, to have it in our space. And if, so I agree with the neutral. There's, I love art. I come to our art shows every year. It's absolutely amazing. We have beautiful artists that come and show their work all the time. I love to go to galleries. I love, so it's not in opposition to any art. It just, if it's a community public space where everyone will be seeing it, I feel like it should have a very neutral tone that everyone is, is comfortable with and not a controversial one. I think that's important because I don't think this board wants to be put on being a censor for any way, I think. And I do like the, the term neutral, you know, I think because it's- Art isn't supposed to be neutral. 
Art yeah. is supposed to be someone's expression of their the perception of the world or whatever. I mean, there's public money spent on art all over the world, and some art you love and some art you hate. Um, I, I, I think it's really sad if everything in the world has to be neutral, that nobody yeah. can say anything. And, and I'm not taking one side or the other, but it's if you want it neutral, just leave it green. It's neutral right now. Well, maybe that's a, a good thing to consider. I think if you want to talk at art or the art gallery or in someone's personal home, I would agree. Buy what you want, put it there, or don't. But I think when you're putting it in a public space where you have a community of upwards 5,000 or more, I think you really do need to What's the public space? A museum is a public space. This is a public space. You're me. talking about putting it in, in our streets. That's different than choosing to go into a library to be. If, if I go into a certain public space and I don't like what I see, I just walk right back out. But that's not an option if you're posting it on our streets and where we have to drive by. I think it's very different. So the public art on the train bridge or the mural that was put up on the side of axles, you may or may not like either of those, but you're going to drive in or walk by them. But I think they're pretty neutral. Well, that's your opinion. Well, we're looking at and so I don't know what that art is going to look like until we get a chance to work with the artist and the students to see. Right, but you're leading them by asking a specific question. I'm asking them to take perspective. How is that leading? Okay. Um, yeah. I'm just suggesting so that the last I, I think we have issue. I, I, I think we have to wrap up. I think. I don't want to see this board being a censor, either pro or con, but I think there needs to be, as Bill said, some reasonable way to have expression. And again, let the Makers Fierce folk bring something to, to forward to us and we'll react to it. Roger? I've spent a lot of time with kids in Waterbury. I have a lot of confidence in those kids. Uh, I move that we allow MK to take the next step to address those kids about this project, see what sort of designs they come up with, present them to the board, and we can debate that at that point. Roger, are you, can, can, I, not, can I ask you a question, please? Is, well, once, you, once we get to the discussion, it's it's not not tell me well, it's once, once we get to the discussion, we, can we first right. have a second. It's okay. not tell I'll, I'll, I'll second it. To right. I'll second it. I'm just responding to, okay. Do we want to have any further discussion? Yes. I'd like to say that I'm not going to pass judgment until I see what's here presented. Um, I think the goal here, from what I'm understanding, hearing, is let's try to keep our children's out of the political realm, uh, if that's possible. Yeah. No, I'm just. I'm not saying it's going there. Yeah. But let's try to keep it from going there, I guess. That would be my sentiment. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'll be excited to see what's brought forward. Let's do your hand up. Oh. There's a hand up. OK. Where? I can't see the. Chiomi. OK. Hi, everyone. My name's Chiomi McKibben. I'm a resident of the town of Waterbury. I'm also a member of the Public Art Committee at the Water Barrier Area Anti-Racism Coalition. I think um, one thing I just want to note is I've had conversations about work putting together ideas for public art around town. And I think a lot of people make the assumptions that because we are an anti-racism group, that our art is automatically going to be political. It's automatically going to be controversial when that's not the case at all. We just want public art in town. And I think it's there's a lot of assumptions being made of what it's gonna look like. In reality, we don't know what it's gonna look like. You know, we don't have any drafts up. We're letting the kids decide what they wanna paint on the electrical boxes. Um, so I think that there's a lot of assumptions that this is gonna be something um, really controversial when in reality, we don't know what it's gonna look like yet because we're waiting for the kids to put together their own ideas and what they want to paint on the electrical boxes. Thank you for that comment. I think we've made a statement uh, to direct Makersphere to look into that and 
they'll come back with a formalized plan. We have a motion and a second. Uh, do we, I do just, we want to take a vote? Just want to be clear that I'm here with the anti-racism hat on, but also then <laughs> my other hats. But Makersphere isn't taking on this project. MK is part of Water Area Area Anti-Racism Coalition, as well as former art teacher, as well as art in the community maker sphere. So it's not just, I just don't want, I want to be transparent. Understand. Okay, thank you. Does the board have any further questions? If not, we'll go to vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> Motion carries. <coughs> Thank you, MK. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, MK. Okay. Next item on the agenda is Blackback Pub Entertainment Permit and Outside Consumption Permit. Right. So Lynn Mason, one of the owners, came in with two outside consumption permits. One is an expansion of their outside consumption on the Stowe Street side of the building. They currently have outside consumption on the Main Street side. Um, and the second is to serve beverages to coincide with the music in the alley, which you approved last meeting, I believe, mm -hmm. which is on July 22nd and August 26th. I don't know if you want to do all these at once, but the entertainment permit, um, they want a two to three person band to provide light music on Thursdays through Saturdays for about, from about six to 10. They're using the upstairs of the uh, the building now is kind of like a holding area for people to go be seated, and they just want light music for people to listen to while they're waiting. You're talking about that small deck that they have, is there? No, inside. inside. Oh, inside. They, they own the building, okay. so upstairs, on the Stowe, inside the Stowe Street side. Okay. And the uh, outdoor permit is up on the deck of the Stowe Street side? Is that what you're talking That's about? That's the new one. Yeah, they right. want to have that they're asking for. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. And they talked with DLC and they said, you know, submit and submit the permits. Just saying you're expanding your outside consumption. Mm -hmm. right. Any, any further it? comments before we, or, or do we just want to go to a motion? So their music inside is not going to conflict with the music outside, right? Mm -hmm. That's the same time as music in the alley. No, the music in the alley is only two evenings. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. But it's not like noise is going to be an issue, like competing, right? I don't have that uh, level of detail. I I'm doubt sure they, they would compete with themselves. With yeah. Them yeah. <laughs> that kind of no. Yeah. yeah. No. I don't know. I'll move to accept all okay. three. Roger moved um, the permit. We have a second. Let's well, second it. Any further discussion? There being none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Next item <coughs> tax rate homestead filing penalty. Bill. Okay, it's tax rate and homestead filing penalty. So I sent you. Um, an email on Friday uh, with information about the tax rate uh, we received uh, as as we're supposed to this year uh, the notification from the Department of Education and the State Department of Taxes about the education tax rate the grand list has been filed uh, we have a couple of minor um, grievances that won't change the grand list significantly. So the school taxes are actually going down from last year, the homestead rate uh, in 2022, set by the state 1.7622, as opposed to 1.7986, it's down a little more than 2%. The non-homestead rate is uh, $1.6956, down from $1.7560. Uh, that's 3.44 percent down. Uh, so that uh, that's helpful. Um, 
The grand list in Wadbury did not rise to the degree that I anticipated it would. Um, and I made some poor assumptions, I guess, uh, with all of the uh, sales of properties, especially residential properties, over the past couple of years that have been really going gangbusters. I thought the grand list might increase by 1.5%. It increased about half that much, 0.73%. Um, and I was disappointed in that. I talked to Dan Sweet, the assessor, and he said, well, you're right. Uh, all of the residential properties that are selling are selling for multiple times what uh, the, the tax listing is. But we can't change them unless we change all of them. So in other words, we have to do a reappraisal. There have been times in the past when, when we had a hot housing market in certain segments. For instance, uh, you know, back when Tom Vickery was here, probably 10, 12 years ago, there was a, a point in time where properties that were, say, between 450 and 650,000 were really uh, selling well above the market. And he actually reappraised that small slice of the grand list. And uh, I thought maybe we'd be doing that again, but Dan indicates that it's across all the grand lists. So really, the, the, the reappraisal, uh, which probably be not next year, but maybe the year after, excuse um, me, excuse is me. necessary. Bill, did Dan give you any indication of uh, what part, um, percentage perhaps, of new construction that played into this? Yeah, and there is there is new construction. Um, the new construction has to be fit into the existing grand list as well. So if something is a million dollars, it's probably not listed that way now because it's got a dovetail with everything else. Um, but in my defense, even though the estimate was about half, um, we did lose value on the power generating dam uh, that we know power has significant value. If that had just stayed the same, uh, the increase would have been 1%. Um, and for those who you don't understand, um, the, when the new FERC license was issued to Green Mountain Power, uh, they no longer can use that dam to make peak, peak power. They used to be able to hold water back uh, in the summer pool. The summer pool was supposed to be 740 feet. Uh, they could raise the elevation in the pool to 742, and then they could draw it down to uh, 738. They had four feet of uh, head that they could release on you know, some afternoon that was 95 degrees and everybody wanted their air conditioning. Uh, it's a run of the river dam now. What comes in to the reservoir goes out. So uh, they're still generating power, but it's not anywhere near as valuable to them as it used to be. And therefore, when you do an income analysis, and, and Dan doesn't do this. This is, this is done by the, the state folks. So the, the power dam uh, value did go down, and uh, that exacerbated the problem. Um, so anyway, if you divide the $4,139,475 of taxes that we voted to uh, impose on ourselves this year by the grand list, uh, the tax rate comes out to 53.4 cents. Uh, the voters at town meeting authorized the tax rate to be set at no more than 53 cents, so we've got to round down that four-tenths of a penny. And uh, I put that in the memo, I didn't bring it, but uh, so there's a, a little bit of lost revenue uh, that, you know, our, our, our tax uh, bill will not generate quite the 4139475. Uh, having said that, though, there's a few other things that are going to offset that. Um, our pilot payment is going to be significantly higher than we anticipated. The, uh, the, the hold harmless or current use is going to be a couple thousand dollars higher than we anticipated. 
And our fund balance, we did a superb job of collecting delinquent taxes at the end of the year. So our, our fund balance was significantly higher than budgeted. And, you know, I apologize. I, I, I'm happy that it's that way. I mean, I, I project the fund balance the best I can uh, when the year closes on December 31st and we're doing a budget in the middle of January. It's, it's hard to get it exact. There's, there's some revenue that comes in that gets posted back because it was from a year ago. There's some expenses that come in and get posted back. So um, I think we'll be in, in good shape and we'll see that when we talk about the budget in a minute. So my recommendation to the board is uh, set the tax rate at 53 cents. Um, given the higher than anticipated fund balance, given that the um, pilot payment will be a little bit higher, you know, I toyed with the idea of saying, well, you could round it down further if you wanted, but the school taxes are going down. The, uh, the total tax rate for homesteads all inclusive this year will be 1.15% 1, 1 lower than last year. It will be 329.56, I mean 229.56 as opposed to 230.22. And the non-homestead is going to be down uh, about 2%, 2.2% 2 .2 uh, at $2.22.9. And uh, the last year it was $2.27.96. So because it's going to be a lower tax rate for everybody than it was last year, I think that given that uh, our tax rate should be 53.4. We should just go with what the taxpayers uh, authorized us to, to, to levy, which is a 53 cent tax rate. If there's, a, you know, I think right now I am projecting that we'll have a small fund balance next year. Uh, and we haven't even talked about the ARPA funds yet. So I think we're going to be pretty good going forward. Uh, but there are some shadows. Uh, Room in the budget report too, uh, most of which revolve around petroleum costs. Uh, so anyway, that's my recommendation for the tax rate, 53 cent tax rate for municipal services, and then uh, 0.17 for um, the Underground child care contract and point one seven for the veterans exemption. Any comments from the board? Phil, do we have the authority to uh, approve a tax rate higher than what the voters approved? No. no. So fifty three is as high as we can go. Fifty three is as high as we can yeah. go. And um, you know, I recommended that because frankly I thought with a one and a half percent grand list yeah. increase yeah, that, yeah. that maybe we would have a lower tax rate than that and I wanted to be able to go to 53 in case there were things that moving forward indicated that we should. But um, many years the voters, we, we present the voters with a motion to simply raise a certain amount of taxes and if they had done that, then we'd just divide it and we could say 53.4. Mm -hmm. But this year we recommended to them to approve the budget and set a tax rate and they did. So 53 is as high as you can. Um, I have a question on the municipal tax rate per se, but can you just state for the record around the common level of appraisal, it's showing we're at 86%. What is the statutory requirement for when we need to reappraise? And do we anticipate that's likely next year? Uh, probably not next year. Okay. Um, Dan, and I'll, I'll confirm with him, but uh, Dan and I talked about a reappraisal uh, several months ago, back when we were putting the budget together. Uh, when you look at the budget report, you'll see that we did budget this year to move $75,000 from the general fund back into the reappraisal fund. When, when the state started paying us about $20,000 or so a year, um, they, they set up a fund 
and they, they, <laughs> it's a pro parcel amount that you get. And our receipt from the state was about 21. And when Tom Vickery was here, we used to use, say, five or $6,000 a year to offset the costs of running the Lister's office. Um, and then we started seeing what the appraisal costs were going to be. Tom, uh, who had worked in Waterbury for a long, long time, he was a, a private contractor, but he worked for Waterbury, Duxbury, and Stowe, basically. Uh, and, and he always did it, and we got a really good price. We paid him more than we normally pay, but compared to having to go out and get XYZ, the appraisal company, um, it was a really good deal. And when Tom retired, uh, we decided then to stop moving money from the reappraisal fund to run the Lister's office to, to conserve money. And then when we saw what Barry had paid, and I don't remember this off the top of my head now, and what some of the other uh, surrounding communities were paying on a per parcel level for reappraisals, Dan and I talked and I said, maybe we ought to put $75,000 for the next couple of years back in the reappraisal fund. So we've done that. Um, so I told, I, I asked Dan, because he, he does this service for Duxbury as well. He works 28 hours a week for us. I'm not sure how many hours he works in Duxbury, maybe, maybe the other uh, 12, I'm not sure. But um, I talked to him and said, you know, we should think about when it's time to go out for an appraisal that Duxbury and Waterbury should put you know, together Team and up. get some economy of scale kind of that way. So um, we'll be back to, to talk about that. But we're not in dire, you know, I think we were 89 or 91. I don't have last year's sheet with me, but it's been dropping a little bit more quickly of late, but I don't think we're going to be in trouble with the law this year, this year, next year, or probably not even the year after. But um, it's good to reappraise before you have that mandate. Any further questions? Yeah, the discussion about ARPA funds. <clears throat> Is there any reason to think that we should add that before, before we set the tax rate? Or is there nothing that that pot of money could do to? Well, yeah, you could, you could put, you could say reduce the tax rate by, you know, $1.5 million. Yeah, no, I'm, not, I'm, not, yeah, I'm not interested in just reducing the tax rate. Uh, yeah. You know, put it towards something that and maybe in turn reduces the tax rate? Mm -hmm. You know, you're getting a bang for your buck? Well, I think, I think you'll do that. Or, or My expectation is you'll have that discussion and you'll do that in next year's budget. Okay, so mm -hmm. that must be the next not, part of my question is, now. with the economics being what they are, are we better off to take a look at that for next year yeah, as opposed I mean, to I this think year? This, this is a very <clears> modest <throat> increase. It's, the tax rate is gonna be exactly what the, the voters uh, anticipated it would be, um, you know, it's it's um, it's not quite a two percent increase from last year. Inflation's running six or eight percent, so I, th I think it's very reasonable for right now. But no, I think your ARPA discussion should be dealing for next year. Maybe you know, I'd spread it out. You've got a couple of years exactly. to, yeah. to spend it. Two years. Um, so I'll move to uh, approve a uh, 53 uh, cent uh, tax rate. Thank you, Roger. We have a second. Does he have to do the second? Second. Just separate. Carl? Sorry. Who seconded that? Danny. 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 Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Okay, now you need to make a motion to uh, set two fourth tax rates. The veterans exemption that, so um, the state law says veterans, disabled veterans get a $10,000 um, 
exemption on their property. Uh, while we voted a number of years to go, I think we exempt, exempt it to 40,000 as opposed to 10. The state allows you to do that, but if you go above the 10, you have to pay the education fund. So the cost for the veterans exemption over $10,000 is uh, $13,428 this year. If you divide that into the grant list, it's a, an additional tax rate of 0 0.0017. And then uh, a year or so ago, uh, in the spring of 21, we, uh, we had a uh, court case and we had a settlement with Hunger Mountain Child Care. And Hunger Mountain Child Care pays the municipal tax, but not the education tax. Um, again, the state allows you to do that if the town, uh, if everyone else in the town picks up the, uh, the education tax. So again, that cost to the, to the town in 2022 is um, $12,965, and that rounds, it's 0 0.00167, so round that up to 0 0.0017 as well. So if you could add, uh, make a motion to add 0 0.0017 for both veterans exemption and hunger amount child care exemption, that would round it up. We have a motion. So moved. Thank you, Chris. I'll second Chris's motion. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not all in favor, say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. There's also a provision in the law that requires um, homestead declarations to be filed by the lot uh, property owners. Um, I forget when the deadline is. Most of us, if we are with it, file it with our income tax return. Okay. That's the deadline. Uh, that's the deadline now. Uh, yes. there, is a, there is a provision in the state law that allows a penalty of up to 8% for late filing, uh, and it's a complicated law. It's this, if uh, you file late and the homestead um, tax is higher than the uh, non-homestead non tax, and it's something different. Uh, we have been in the practice of late of recommending a 2% late fee regardless of the relationship between the homestead and non-homestead rates. Um, we're recommending 2% because a 2% penalty on the average residential property, and those are the ones who would be guilty of late filing a homestead. You don't file a homestead if you're a commercial property. The average residential uh, property with a 2% late filing fee, will pay somewhere between $50 and $100 of the late fee. Uh, and when we were charging 8% before, it was really kind of usury. It was way more. The idea is that you want to um, be able to recoup the expenses of having to print a new tax bill for somebody. 50 bucks, clearly, we can do it for that. Uh, nobody's filing a late homestead penalty uh, uh, declaration here because they're trying not to pay more taxes because the homestead rate is is high. So um, anyway, so do we have a motion to, to that effect to do a two percent? Uh, yeah, I'll move to uh, we uh, can state a two percent uh, penalty rate. Thank you, Roger. We have a second. second. We have less than a second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Okay. We'll move on to the manager's items. Discussion of highway projects and schedule. Yeah, this will be very brief. It's not really too much of a Schedule. There's two. There's two projects that you need to take some action on. Um, one, if you remember, we have in the budget this year um, for paving. Uh, we're going to pave Stowe Street. 
uh, and uh, North Street and Hill Street. Um, so the paving uh, of Stowe Street is, we've got $270,000 budgeted and uh, we have uh, a grant uh, from the state of 175 to go toward that project. Uh, the requirement by the state, if you're going to use the state's paving grant, is you have to put the project out to bid. Uh, you can't just hire your local everyday paver like sometimes we are wanting to do. So we did put the paving out to bid. Uh, we had three bidders, uh, Whitcomb, ST Paving, and Pike. Um, Pike was high, uh, significantly higher than everyone else. Um, Whitcomb was $83.25 uh, per ton for Stowe Street. ST Paving was $83.75, so for $0.50, cents, uh, we have to take Whitcomb. The state says that you have to take a low bidder unless you can show that they're not qualified to do the job. Um, I think that's overkill, but it's the law. We can't do anything other than that. So I would ask the select board to accept the price from Whitcomb. Um, and uh, you know, I didn't make copies of this, but if you want to see. that compare to past? Uh, bills. Well, we haven't we haven't we haven't bid it for a while. Right. Um, typically, we've negotiated with ST Paving. Uh, in fact, you know, we were thinking about um, you know would we hire ST Paving to do other streets, but uh, their bid for the other streets were actually significantly higher. So they really sharpened their pencil on the Stowe Street project. Um, and there was some talk that Whitcomb was going to sub it out to ST, which would have been really nice for us because we would have got the lowest price, plus it would have been the local people doing the work. Right. But I don't think that uh, Whitcomb is going to sub it out. Um, so anyway, okay. that's what where was we the are. $83.25 a ton. I entertain a motion. <clears throat> I'll move to accept Whitcomb's bid on Still Street Project for a repaving. Thank you, Chris. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Roger. Uh, we have a motion to second. Any further discussion? Uh, is there a time frame for that, Bill? Um, I'm hoping uh, next week or the week after next that is quick. what the, the hope is. So. And uh, talking to Bill Woodruff here, just a little while back, um, I don't know if you want to wait and have this conversation after this is motions made and seconded and located or whatever. Uh, Bill said something about possible extra money to maybe do some additional stuff elsewhere that just to kind of tide over some of these other roads till we can. Uh, he hasn't okay. talked to me about oh, it yet. Okay. So, so, you know, speak out of turn here. No, it's okay. I mean, <coughs> I'm, not, I'm not upset by that. Um, we'll, we'll just have to see. Um, and, you know, we've done that in the past. Uh, but, we've, you know, the, the main jobs, it's the Stowe Street job, North Street, as you, if you've gone up there, you can see North Street's already been milled. Um, Railroad Street, really out of shape. Got to do that one. I mean, not Railroad Street, Hill Street. And then, um, if all goes well, we'll get that culvert up on Perry Hill, Hill replaced down in the dip. Blush Hill, you mean? Yeah, Blush Hill, I'm sorry. Um, just beyond Lonesome Trail okay. and get that done. And then we'll pave all the way out from Lonesome Trail to the end and put the top on. Um, we are having difficulties with getting contractors, um, and you'll see that uh, on this one. So the other project that we did put out to bid, uh, we have $200,000 in the uh, infrastructure budget, I believe it is, um, to... Uh, 
No, we didn't vote. Oh, I'm just. No, we're just. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was just okay. Yeah. So motion's been made and seconded. And yes. <laughs> no more <laughs> further <laughs> discussion. No more further discussion. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Okay. Sorry about that. So in the infrastructure budget, we budgeted two hundred thousand dollars to uh, do some work on. Reservoir Road in from Route 100 to the center side of State Park. And as I've joked, if you're driving there, the guardrail is really curved. Uh, you know, it's just sinking down, down, down. And we've had problems in, in the past. We've addressed this uh, once or twice before. Um, we, Alec had people, you know, geolo geologists and people from UVM to help try to figure out what needs to be done there. So anyway, we put a uh, scope together and put that out, um, and we asked Jay McDonald and Kingsbury to, um, to uh, give us a price on that. Uh, Jay McDonald's price, $192,050. Uh, Kingsbury's price, when it first came in, was $99,000. And um, Alec looked at it and said, I think they missed a few things. Uh, they did something wrong. It shouldn't be $100,000. We're hoping it would be cheaper than $192.50. But um, so we called Kingsbury and gave him a second bite of the apple without telling them the other bid. And their sharpened pencil price came in at $399,000. <laughs> Quite a sharp pencil. <laughs> sharp. I'm not here, I'm not here to please Lisa. I'm not making fun of Kingsbury. It's, no. it's just kind of ironic how things work. And, you know, maybe when we gave them the opportunity to, to look it over again, they had a full plate, and they didn't say, well, if they give us $400,000 to do this, we'll do it, but we'll, we'll pass. we don't really have time. I, you know, I, I don't know. So uh, McDonald is set to begin in September. We want to wait until after Labor Day uh, when the park, well, it won't be closed until Columbus Day, but it will be much less traffic going in there. Um, but you do have to accept the proposal from Kingsbury. So. Thank you. So, in September, what date are we talking? It just says in September right now. Okay. Okay. Because that's when the switch changes from good to bad, and I know for a fact that <coughs> the latter part of September, it goes from I won't say summertime to wintertime, but yeah. conditions can really get difficult. Can start raining. Yeah, to bed. And they get crappy. And yeah, I think the <clears throat> idea is we're hoping to get in right after Labor Day. Labor Day is early this year. I don't have any uh -huh. more than that. Obviously, we're a little bit at, you know, okay. at discretion. Uh, it'd be pretty difficult to do that project in the summertime. So. Well, no, the problem is, I mean, it, the difficulty of the project itself. You, oh, would, right. you wouldn't want to be doing it in the mud either. No, know, no, that's absolutely. <coughs> and if, if conditions deteriorate before they start, we'll put it off. I mean, you know, yeah. I don't think we're going to want to go in there and just have them muck around and make it worse. Right, that's what I'm saying. So, right. uh, you know, we'll work with them. And, you know, they, they're a good contractor, as all of you, I think, saw for the most part on uh, Main Street. Yeah. And they don't want to screw it up either. So. Yeah. But if somebody will make a motion to approve that, uh, accepting the Jay McDonald bid, I would appreciate it. I move that we accept the Jay McDonald bid of $192,050. Thank you, Roger. Second? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussions? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion passes. Okay, let's move on to allocation of ARPA funds. Okay, so uh, first thing I have to say is that I don't have any better information than I had the last time about whether or not the select board has final authority 
or if you need to go to the voters. Uh, I explained at the last meeting, Chris, that um, when I talked with, uh, I, I called Fred Plessy from Sullivan and Powers to just ask them when they did the audit this year if they could just consider the ARPA money as general fund money because the select board had indicated several meetings ago that we wanted to use it as just replacement revenue. We can use up to $10 million for that. And if they would just call it a general fund, fund balance, life would be simple. When you're talking to auditors, they're worse than talking to lawyers. Hmm. Nothing is ever simple and there's all kinds of reasons why, oh, we can't do that and it's deferred revenue and all, all this stuff that I'm not sure of. So I explained to them that we wanted to use it as last revenue. Uh, we did make a few appropriations this year. And then in that conversation, I, I said, well, the information we're getting from the League of Cities and Towns and from, is Linda still here? Yeah, yeah Linda's still here. Yeah. From Linda is uh, about the money that we were talking about appropriating to um, CV Fiber was that the select board had the final authority. And Fred's comment was, well, the legislative body has the final authority, but in Vermont, the legislative body for the purposes of appropriations is town meeting, unless you have a city charter. So the select board isn't really the final authority. They recommend the budget. And he said, you kind of did that with your other, you know, your ICE Center appropriation and the $600,000 that we were going to give to EFUD that they said no thank you to. Um, so, I mentioned at the last meeting, maybe we should have a special town meeting, but if you have a special town meeting, it, it's an open town meeting, it's not, uh, it's not by ballot, so now everything is on the table and people can make a motion to, you know, give Billy Big Door a million dollars, whether he wants to give Brilliant. it to the general, to the conservation fund or not, that would be up to him. So, the, um, the idea of just having kind of a freewheeling uh, town meeting doesn't appeal too much to me. Um, a lot of other communities are making decisions about ARPA money with their select boards. I think the auditors of the world are going to have to get over it. Um, I do expect, even though I could tell Fred when he calls that I'm retired now, I'm to somebody else. <laughs> I do expect that since I will be here all of 2022 that I'll probably be somehow involved in answering questions about how 2022 money was spent. Um, the worst thing that the auditors can do is say that you have a material weakness in your, in your, uh, uh, in your financial statements, that you didn't follow your normal procedures. Uh, I don't think anybody could stretch it to say it's, it's fraud, it's a vote of the legislative body. Um, and even if somebody did say that, nobody, I don't think anybody would you know, try to prosecute on that. So having said all that, I, I, I think, you know, and I'm still going to try to talk to the folks at BLCT. And at your next meeting, Ted Brady is going to be here, by the way. Uh, he's the executive director of BLCT. If you want to ask him about his opinion about it and what they're telling their membership, uh, we can do that together. Um, so anyway, having said all that, I, I think a town meeting is a bad idea. Um, and a special I, town meeting. Yeah, a special town meeting. We're going to have to do that at regular town meeting, but at least we'll be prepared for it. Um, and several meetings ago, you made the decision to appropriate $50,000 of ARPA money to CD Fiber. So I think, I think we should just do that and let the chips fall where they may. It's $50,000, it's not a million five. Um, I, think, I think in the end, it will all work out. Having said that, um, I sent, um, Linda and Chris an email several weeks ago with 
the contract that Linda had sent to me uh, with some uh, amended language that I explained in the email. And I sent it to them because at the time I didn't know who the executive director was or if even if they had hired me. And um, didn't hear anything. And then uh, a little bit before the last meeting, I emailed Linda and asked her if there was an executive director. I had heard that it was Jamil Smith. Uh, was that true? She emailed me back and said yes. So I sent this to uh, the executive director last week, and uh, Linda sent something back this afternoon that came at 5.30 into my email address, and I wasn't here. So I just got it before I came to the meeting. So Linda is on the, um, on the screen here, and I had several items that I had put in yellow, uh, and I got the email back from Linda saying, uh, most of the yellow is okay, but it's kind of modified by what's in green. And Linda, I guess the one thing that I'm, I'm wondering why it has to be in here is in number three, it's on page two, and I think I suggested that the language be taken out. It is understood that the town may receive ARPA funds over one or more years and that the contribution and assignment to CV fiber shall take place within 30 days of each subsequent receipt. Um, we've already received half of our ARPA money. We've appropriated $50,000. I don't know why we have to have language saying that we have to give you money after the next one. So. Uh, I, I know you're not the lawyer, but that's the one kind of question that I have. <coughs> and then uh, in number five, uh, I have no idea what that um, uh, technical language means. But uh, those are my major questions. I suggest that you talk with Janelle. She is the one that made these changes. And she is the lawyer representing CV Fiber. Um, I would like to point out that on section three, it says it is understood that the town may receive ARPA funds. And it doesn't say that you have to appropriate any more to us. That's all it says. Okay, well, I'll talk to Janiel. Um... I think they were uh, extremely happy with the, the contract that you had sent. Um, she made just a few changes and they are, would like to proceed with the contract. So please discuss your objections with uh, Janiel. Yeah, it's not really an objection. It's just a clarification that okay. our appropriation was fairly simple, $50,000 uh, if it doesn't all get used for this particular project, we want whatever's not used back. Um, and and uh, it's just confusing to have the language in there to me about a subsequent uh, receipt of ARPA funds because we've got way more than enough to give you all $50,000 now. So, But anyway, let me just work this out. I think at the next meeting it can be resolved and authorize me to sign it. Yeah, I'm uncomfortable because I know I got that like two seconds before I came here right. and I didn't have a chance to review it, so I'm not about uh, to. You got it two seconds after I got it, guys. I, I, I'm not saying I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure, <laughs> but, it's, but it's the timing. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I, didn't, I didn't send it to Janiel until late last week, yeah. so it's nobody's fault. It's so, a holiday and everything else. It's just... We'll, we'll deal with it. And we'll I did it. not expect um, a signature or anything tonight, and I didn't expect a vote on it. Uh, it's unreasonable to ask the select board to make a decision on 10 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Linda, for understanding. Okay. I've been trying to get it to you, but the 4th of July holiday kind of blew it off. So I'm sorry. Um, take your time. Discuss it with Janiel. We'll, I'm sure we can come to a resolution. Thank you. We'll put that in for the next meeting. 
Bill, other ARPA issues? Uh, really nothing tonight. I think we, uh, again, for Chris's benefit, at the last meeting we talked about um, sometime <coughs> this fall maybe starting to have conversations with the community about what the ARPA funds will be used for. I, I think it will be, uh, it may be tough for the select board just to deal with it all during the budget process that right. typically happens in December and January. So, um, uh, you know, and, and it will be up to the select board, of course, to present the budget to the voters at town meeting next year, and right. the voters will have their say up or down, of course. But um, I, 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 the sense I got from the board was you'd like to have this conversation I would agree with that statement. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason to have a conversation amongst us select board members as to what we might have for ideas? And yeah, I think there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. You know, you're obviously getting input from the public, but you, know, you might want to uh, shepherd it a little bit and, and talk about things from the perspective of the board as to, to what's important. So. Maybe make a list, in specific list, of, yeah. list of do's and don't or don'ts, you know, what we might want to use it for and what we definitely wouldn't want to use it for or try to narrow down the scope as to <clears throat> possibilities for it. Um, because there will be a very global wants, a lot of, lot of wants well, out the there. Thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I would like to have I'd like to see it get used in such a manner, if it were possible, to have a long-lasting impact on on our tax rate and mm -hmm. in the quality of the community. Agree. Any other comments? Yeah, I uh, think that uh, we would want to focus on one-time capital expenses rather than ongoing right. uh, budgetary items. That we you know, be a one-time shot, and then we can get hit the next time that we don't have any federal funding. Yeah, totally agree with that statement, Roger. Any other comments, Danny, Melissa? I think we should talk about it more and come up with the process. Yep. I am a little wonder, concerned about the uh, sidewalks on Randall Street. They didn't get mentioned tonight. <laughs> didn't get mentioned last time, so. If well, the sidewalks on Randall Street are still scheduled to go this year. Okay, good. Um, we are planning to do the work ourselves, so there's no need to put it out to bid. Um, and, uh, the, you know, there is always the possibility that all of it doesn't get done. I'm not really fearful any longer that none of it will get done this year. Um, but. Things come up and things have to be uh, fit in. <clears throat> the grant that we got from the state, uh, $200,000 for a $240,000 project. Um, some of that money is to s pay for lighting in Rusty Parker Park and mm -hmm. trash receptacles in Rusty Parker Park, and then the rest of it is for sidewalks. Um, <clears throat> and we have two years to spend that grant money, so if it doesn't all get finished in 2022, Roger, it's still there and it will be done next year. Uh, okay. the, the hope is, my hope is that at least, well, my hope is that all of it gets done. And, and then descending uh, least favorable options would be okay, we get Randall Street done and Park Row ends up waiting until next year. Um, I can't imagine that we can't get at least one side of Randall Street done. But the goal is still, it's still in place to get all of it done. Okay. So just to clarify, when you say we're doing it, uh, I didn't know our highway department was used to pouring sidewalks. Well, we did. Both sides of Winooski Street, we did. So set, set the forms and 
Or are we still using foam as well? In some places we have, yeah. We did, I know we did down here. Any further questions? If not, let's move on. Budget report. Okay. She doesn't have it. She um, asked for the library, but I didn't see it. Okay. Here's the it's high technology, Danny. Mm -hmm. Is it? Uh, do you have I a can, better proposal? I can go email send it? It to you. Okay, Bill can go email it to you. Thank you. Thanks. Danny, do you want that library information tomorrow? Yes, they can. Okay. I don't have it, but I'll get it from Rachel. Excellent. Thank you very much. Did you let me know you weren't coming, Danny? Did not. I just decided right before, and I did only emailed Mike. Yeah. Okay. Because I emailed it to Lisa because I didn't know she should be here, but I'll be right back. You can look it over. You can formulate all your questions, and we can get out of sight. Sorry, Duffy Lovely. Let's get our hopes up. That's the hard copy to the library. Does anybody have an extra orange one? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Send it to Danny tomorrow. Yep. You want to play bingo, Lisa? I'm going to play bingo. Bingo. Oh, yeah, I think that's bingo. They also have a bingo. I'm pretty close. I think I could be be bingo pretty quick. Yeah, I've already ticked off a couple. All right, back to budget. What's the pilot again? Payment in lieu of taxes, okay. but I don't know what pay specifically. In of, pay in lieu of taxes from the state. state That's properties. what the state for like mm -hmm. all state their properties they pay. State-owned properties and laundering. Is it always they owe forty percent of the town. <laughs> significant. That's why I asked. Yeah, yeah they're paying. For should be. Should be more. They're paying for an empty hole. Great neighbors. <laughs> We didn't get that. Am I full of this thing? We didn't get this in advance. No. no. Okay. I don't think we usually do. I'm just. This may be recent projections. start Bill. Um, well, let me start at the end to go to page 11. Right now, um, given all of the pluses and minuses of um, pilot money and uh, other state funds and over budget on petroleum and everything else. At the moment, uh, I'm projecting that when we end the year, we'll have about $80,000 in the fund balance. And uh, we built the budget for the three operating funds to have no money in the fund balance. So, um, so right now, we're still projecting uh, better than budgeted. Um, sure. 
they'll uh, get eighty thousand uh, dollars more revenue than expenses. Uh, obviously, that can change. Um, our, now, if you go back to the beginning, uh, things in yellow that you see highlighted in yellow are uh, negative things. Um, so, property taxes uh, for the general fund, two million twenty-nine thousand, is what we're going to uh, bill uh, when we do the tax bills this week. Um, I'm projecting a ninety-seven percent. Collection rate, so there's three percent to the bad. Um, when we get to the end of the year, it will probably be almost 100 percent. We've been very good at tax collection of late. The school taxes, um, we get 0.225 of one percent of school taxes uh, since the school tax rate just went down. Um, I don't know if that will translate into school tax revenues actually going down because we've got a, a little increase in the grand list. There'll be more property that's being taxed than there was before, but I reduced that projection. It's, it's uh, de minimis. It's not a big deal. The things in blue, um, those are information that have just come from the Department of Taxes. Um, they always have a caveat there saying the final number won't be known until we send you the check in October or November, but pretty much those are on, and you can see there were about uh, 37, almost $38,000 to the good in pilot. Um, Do you know why those went up there? Out of curiosity. Why the pilot went up? Yeah, why, the pilot, why did the pilot go up? Um, well, there's a couple reasons that it could be. I don't know for certain. So, pilot is based on a formula. It's the insured value of the property. So, maybe the insured values has gone over up. here that get adjusted all the time. Just like your house and at my house. Uh, um, so, it's based on the, the uh, insured values of the property, not the fair market value. Uh, and then the revenue that is generated by local option taxes across the state, and then I think there's 14 or 15 communities now that have local option taxes. Uh, they're allowed to uh, have a local option tax of 1% on rooms and meals, on sales, and on alcohol. Uh, all of the above or any combination. So some towns just do rooms and meals, some towns do all three sometimes just do sales. Um, the state takes 30% of the 1%. I don't know that. <laughs> yeah, so those towns that have local option taxes, if they collect a million dollars in local option taxes, it all gets sent to the state with the state sales tax from by the merchants. And if there's a million dollars of local option tax in Stowe, uh, still get seven hundred thousand dollars. The thirty, the three hundred thousand stays with the state. The state takes a little bit of that for administration, and then they distribute the balance to the communities like ours that have state property. So, the local option tax revenue is likely went up somewhat. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so remember, yellow is is a negative. Green is a positive, and that dark blue on page two means I just have to uh, look at that a little bit. Uh, that's that particular one is recreation program revenues, and uh, the budget is 99,000. We're already at almost 138,000, and I just want to make sure with Nick and Michelle that some of that maybe should be on the line below that the mini camp income. Uh, it, it may be in, it may be in the, on the proper line, but it could be some misposting as well. So, the good news is that revenues for all the recreation is up uh, fairly significantly still, um, but it might not be posted on the proper line. Um, you see there at the top of the page, town clerk's fees. Um, last year we took in. Uh, 
Was it a little bit over 100 or a little bit under 100? Town clerk's fees last year was 101,143. So I budgeted the same amount, and again, that was probably uh, foolishness on my part, uh, except not to the degree that it's looking like. So the last, in 2021 and in 2020, uh, there were lots of refinancings of mortgages, and when they do that, they have to file a uh, record the deed or the mortgage, uh, the mortgage deed from the bank, and when interest rates are in the you know two percent range, there's a lot of refinancing. Uh, now interest rates are up again six percent. So refinancing has petered out. So and speak. then purchase housing purchases as well. And yeah, and that the housing market, market is rounded the corner. Cooled a bit. Um, there's not as much demand because there was a lot of purchasing in 20 and 21, and the interest rates. There was a lot of cash sales in 2021. There were really much chance, but anyway, so home cash sales. We're we're likely not going to make 100,000 with the clerk's fees uh, this year, uh, <coughs> but it's not a killing matter. Um, interest on the sweep, and that's no big deal. It's probably going to be a little less than the two. Um, there's nothing really, well, if you looked at page three, there's something to point out there. Um, at the very bottom of the page, um, in the budget, if you look at the budget report for town meeting, there was $600,000 on that bottom line. Uh, we were going to give $600,000 to EFUD because yeah. they said no to the UDAG transfer. Um, I've taken it out of the budget now, so rather than have the auditors ask me next year why there's a $600,000 variance in this particular line, um, they'll maybe not ask unless they look at the annual report and say, hey, you voted to give them $600,000, and I did So anyway, I, I took that out. Um, there's nothing else that's really uh, anything of particular interest until you get to page five. And at the last meeting, Chris, the board suggested holding off on hiring the community service officer when we visited around Labor Day. So if we don't hire that individual, there's uh, there's about sixty thousand dollars of savings that will uh, drop to the bottom line. Um, I will start looking uh, rather closely um, to see if we have to pull in our forms on any projects. Before uh, we do that, Bill, can you just remind me of what the community service officer was? Yeah, we talked about having the community service officer Kind of perform a couple of functions. I think I know uh, what they are. But. Health officer <coughs> that, uh, for all intents and purposes, I am it. I'm the deputy health officer, but when we get calls, they get forwarded to me. Thank you very much, Carl. Um, Thank you, Carl. <laughs> I, I, I know. I go out <laughs> Believe me, I know. I, I deal with those issues. Uh, the second thing the community service officer was supposed to be would be the animal control officer, mm -hmm. of which we have none mm -hmm. at present, and I won't do that job, even though it's vacant. Uh, and then uh, we've talked about having the community service officer do some ordinance enforcement, mainly involved with parking mm -hmm. uh, in the downtown. Uh, we did a survey. I did, I asked RW to do a quick little survey a couple of months ago with the business community and like surveys I want to do and Alyssa remembers, I, I told the board this, but you weren't here, Chris. Uh, however many businesses there are that responded, let's say 48 responded, it was 45 responded, I mean uh, 25 responded one way and 23 responded the other way. So it was 
split right down the middle. Mm -hmm. We want enforcement of the parking ordinances, and we don't. So, uh, so right now, uh, we haven't <coughs> filled this position. I'm thinking we, we can revisit it around Labor Day, but probably a better time to revisit it is when you start interviewing people for my position and talking to them about the fact that, you know, we don't have these right now. And we can maybe, um, an option to consider instead of thinking about filling it at Labor Day, is maybe start advertising around the time the new manager starts to get somebody to come on for next year, but, you know, the beginning of the year. Um, you know, it's not, a, it's not a lot of work to do the health officer stuff, except when it is. Uh, you know, I probably get, if I get a dozen calls a year for health officer, that's probably a lot. There's always one or two a year that take up a lot of time, and there's been a handful in my career that took a lot of time and a lot of work with attorneys and things like that. And it's just, um, you know, so it's it's something that most days you can do without, but when you need one, it's having it be the town manager may not be the best option. Um, the, the animal control officer, we haven't got hardly any complaints. And maybe it's because people, well, we don't have anybody right now. That didn't seem to matter. You should have more complaints in the summertime. Um, <coughs> the complaints we get now, or you know, where we're missing the animal control officer is again on the times where we get the odd dog bite. Uh, last year there was a dog bite that was very, very uh, bad that happened down at uh, the apartment building where the bargaining team is. Somebody got extremely hurt, uh, had to be hospitalized, and had, I'm sure, thousands of dollars of, of medical expenses. Fortunately, the owner of the dog happened to be from out of state, or very conscientious and good, and they took care of it. Um, I was involved a little bit as the health officer on that one, uh, and then, you know, we didn't have an animal control officer, so nobody got arrested, or nobody's dog got arrested. Um, so it's, it's just one of those things that unless you, uh, when you need it, you need it. And, um, and the ordinance enforcement on the other places where we thought about needing it. Um, the pandemic's over now. We're not having the issues on Blush Hill that we had down at the, at the uh, boat launch. The state's planning to build a parking lot down there to get, I don't know, we can probably get four or five trailers off the eight. boat. Oh, eight, okay. Well, that's better, that's, that's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, That's what the capacity of the parking lot's going to be? Yeah, they say between seven to eight, depending upon the size of the trailer. And, and I, I haven't been up to observe, but we're not getting the complaints from, you know, Hunger Mountain Trailhead that we did. So right now, not filling this position isn't really hurting, but in the future, so it's... Well, that's why I was going to say step. this position maybe ought to be filled based on necessity, not... Not uh, well. The problem <coughs> is, you know, this this position that we put in this budget is a full time position, and it's it, it, again, it's a little bit hard. Who's going to apply for it? We we put this position out there three or four years ago, and it was a part time position with no benefits, and nobody was interested. In it. Nobody. There was not one applicant. Um, the difficulty with the job that I'm talking about is that it, it's kind of a 24-hour-a-day job. And obviously, nobody's going to work 24 hours a day, but animal control officers get called at 10 o'clock at night right. because somebody's dog is chasing a deer or because somebody got bitten or somebody's 
dog got hit by a car, or whatever. Um, we had that Bolton guy that drove like 300 miles looking for a lost dog one night that we had to pay. Um, so the challenge is, you know, the other thing that we talk about is right now how we deal with the winter parking ban. You know, we've got a winter parking ban. Celia basically calls the towing guy in, in uh, Richmond and says, uh, nobody's supposed to be on the street, tow them. Um, it'd be nice if we had like the old village police department that on the nights that's not snowing could just issue some tickets yeah. and, and you know, a $25 fine to get somebody's attention. Oh, I better not leave my car on the street as opposed to just poof, it's gone. And, you know, people say, well, you know, the stars are up. There's no snow going to come. Why? Right. And it's like, so that was the other thing that that position would do. But again, it requires somebody to go out at night. And so I should take it to 12 I'm going to get one person to do this for, you know, 21 bucks an hour or whatever the job was. So anyway, we spent too much time on that. Um, I'm going to start watching closely. Um, uh, there's nothing else really to report until you look at the highway fund. On, it's on page nine. Um, on page nine, I do want to point out we did we did include in this year's budget ninety five thousand dollars of an ARPA fund transfer into the highway fund. Um, and my thought was at the time we kind of. Um, we needed that in order to get to the 53 cent tax rate that we were trying to get to. The highway fund right now, um, I told you at the beginning, it looked like we were going to be $80,000 for the good. Uh, as it stands right now, if you look at page 10, the highway fund is going to be 106000 in the hole, even using the 95000 from Apple. And the idea was if we didn't need the ARPA money to balance the highway budget, we wouldn't transfer it, we would save it for later. Um, the way things are looking right now, we need that money. Um, there's a few things on page 10 that I've got to go over with Celia and Woody and to see if we uh, might need to uh, postpone a few things that we were otherwise going to do. Um, you can see, uh, well, I didn't print the column next to it, but if I remember my math correctly, uh, we budgeted about $70,000 in the highway fund for fuel of various sorts, between heating fuel and diesel fuel and gasoline and propane. And I think uh, we budgeted 70 and we've already spent 62 or something like that. So, we're definitely going to go over on the fuel lines. Um, I think I included in the budget a 10% increase over last year's fuel costs, and obviously they've gone up way more than 10%. Um, and then we had um, about two thirds of the way down the page, you see emergency road repairs. We spent $30,000 there, um, mostly buying um, stone and gravel that we needed during the mud season. So I'm going to probably look at the stone and gravel lines. Uh, we didn't use all of that that we bought at the time. So I think, I think the gravel line and the stone line um, that we budgeted um, 36 for gravel and 9 for stone and we've spent 27 and 1200 uh, I don't think we'll have to spend all of that because we had, we, we stockpiled enough um, mm -hmm. from there. So I'm going to sit down with Woody and Celia to look at this budget in particular because it's clearly the one where our biggest exposure is to, to fuel. I mean, we have that same exposure in the fire, in the fire department. Uh, they have diesel fuel in their trucks, but the trucks mostly sit there. Uh, as opposed to, to our trucks. Um, the sand line, uh, I put here 48,000, uh, is it 48 for sand? 
Yeah, 48,000 for sand. Um, again, we'll look at the pile, see how much we might need. Um, I haven't asked, but uh, and you'd know better, Chris. I mean, I got to assume somebody like Stevie Wilder is going to be raising his price just due to the fuel prices. He has raised his price, and I'm glad you brought this up because I. I I wanted to ask you because she's limited him to a thousand yards and he's almost completed that. I don't know what she's slated to purchase this year. Um, I know there was some leftover from last year. I, I don't know how much without standing on top of the pile and guessing at it, but uh, two things. Uh, <clears throat> I'd, I'd be curious to know if dollar for dollar, if she can, if she can haul it after you know wages, fuel costs, wear and tear on the vehicles. If she can actually time from other projects, if she can afford to haul yeah. it for less herself. Well, and that's why I want to sit down and talk to to Bill because I'm not aware that she gave Steve this direction. And and my guess, it's not a, it's not a guess. Um, even if she could, I'm not sure it's worth doing because uh, there's other things that there's an opportunity cost that you got to build in as well. If you send somebody hauling 40 hours a week, basically they're driving between here and Bolton for 40 hours a week, and however much gravel or sand or whatever it is they got in, that's what they've accomplished. <coughs> and we we pay contractors to do that to save wear and tear on our vehicles and to allow our people to do other things that need to be done. So if she's made that determination already, uh, I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to rescind it, but I'm going to certainly talk to Bill and Celia about that. And, and you know, no, I'm, I'm not trying to... Uh, take a swipe at Celia or any other department head, if they're looking at their budget and they're saying, geez, we're going to go over, we got to do something to save money, I'm all for that. Sometimes they choose the wrong, you know, they, they're penny wise and dollar foolish about something. Yeah. So we'll have that conversation. And I'm just, my other question is, you know, what other areas can we be more efficient in that we haven't been in the past, um, possibly going into the winter. I mean, I, it still sticks in my mind that when you split up the highway department into two different groups during COVID, you had half the guys doing, this, doing the same amount of work as both crews together. That to me showed a huge inefficiency in the crew as a whole, when you can take half of them away and still get the other half to do the same amount of work. And then there's the, the use of the sand on the road, you know, how many times, again, and I've said it in the past, maybe we would be better off sending them home instead of sending them out spreading product if it's not needed uh, just for them to, for something to do. Um, those are other areas that need to be looked at as far as efficiency because the less time they're behind that wheel, if they can still accomplish the same thing, it's savings to us in, in fuel and wear and tear and equipment fuel. breakdowns and, huh? And fuel. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. And we're not the only one going through this. Um, no. I just spoke to my son-in-law, heads of, all of St. Johnsbury in the Northeast Kingdom's district for agency of transportation. And there happens to be another guy that I sat and had conversation with yesterday who operates southern part of the agency of transportation. And they're, the two of them are telling me the same thing, that they're starting to clamp down on efficiencies and, and starting to make their people operate, mm -hmm. you know, more fluently in, in use their head when it comes to, instead of sending seven guys to do a job that could be done by three, you're sending three, uh, yeah. stuff like that. And some of the stories that these guys are telling me, it just, 
makes your blood pressure go up because there's, there's no need of it. But I think, um, you know, looking at efficiencies wherever we can gain them is certainly going to help our bottom line. And I'm, I'm a little concerned about the gravel, and especially the gravel um, and, and stone. You know, I hope we don't have another spring like we had last spring, but um, there's always that chance uh, in graveling some of the roads. I don't even know where we are at on, you know, our, our back road uh, graveling process, whether or not we're where we should be or whether there's more that needs to be done and we're just putting it off because we don't want to spend the money or... No, maybe that's where some of this ARPA money may go. No, I think handy. I think we, you know, we we had some, and I don't remember off the top of my head where we had gravel projects, um, but we we budgeted enough to do uh, some work, and I'll I'll try to bring that to the next meeting. Maybe I'll have Celia come, yeah. and we can talk about. Uh, where we are on some of the projects. One other thing I don't, before we move forward here, I don't want to forget is that I mentioned to Bill here a while back that uh, um, the Bolton Pit is where we get our sand and gravel from right now. And all indications, I mean, I'm not saying that she's gonna, but all indications are looking that like that resources may dry up at some point in the not too distant future. Um, dry up in the sense that she's at that at the age of retirement, and uh, uh, I mean, for instance, she's she closes now on Fridays, and she never used to be, and uh, she's closed all this week, and she never used to be. Uh, so there's indications that she's wor you know less and less open to the. And where's the next closest source? <laughs> Not close. Not close. Probably Wolcott or... Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, Lowell yeah. up in that area. Well, it's, it's so I had mentioned... I had mentioned to Bill, is it, would it be stupid for us to think about stockpiling, stockpiling five, 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 five meters full of sand material? if we had a place to put it um, in anticipation of this because... What do you think? Like that's like an aqua kind of deal? Cause those are the types of things that... Yeah, I just wonder like with the ARPA money to me ARPA money is like real long-term kind of investments versus you know I, I look at sand gravel you know that's kind of operating costs per, know. Percy just bought out Nadu's out of, out of Johnson um, they've been operating here forever and Percy just scooped that up here not too long ago in fact I just got a price list sheet from them I don't know uh, they sell several different products of aggregate and same. Well, everything is consolidation in all these yeah. industries. So. Might be worth taking a look at. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm sorry, Bill. So nope. You said nothing, gravel nothing project. Sorry about it. It's a good discussion. So that, that's basically, yeah, um, I'll be working mainly with Celia and Woody to kind of get updates on where we are with these projects, um, see if there's line items in the highway budget that we should kind of shift into neutral. Uh, I'll certainly ask about the issue with hauling sand and I think even with the price increases that contractors are, are, are passing along, um, yeah. the, the metrics stay the same. Yeah, I, mean, I don't even haul whether it. Whether at, you know, if, if fuel is, uh, you know, 250 a gallon or 550 a gallon, we're all paying it. So if, if, if it made sense before to contract it out, nothing has changed. It's just going to cost right. to do well, that. Yeah. Like <coughs> um, from an efficiency standpoint. Bill, did we get uh, voter authorization for that 95,000 transfer? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was not specific voter authorization, it was in the budget. Okay. So Sorry. In the voters. Um, so that's it. Uh, the library is the last page. Uh, things are looking pretty normal there. Right now. Um, we did order the three speed limit oh, signs. 
um, as some of the purchase order uh, a couple of days after your last meeting. Um, and I don't know the exact price, but the three together were between $9,000 and $10,000. So $3,000. Oh, so expecting to me. So anyway, fish. Uh, four to six weeks lead time. Okay. Supply chain. Well, the, the constituents that came forward uh, before us are very happy about the fact that uh, you got signs on either side of that little yep. community so on we'll the more little river road. road. When they get here, we'll get them out. But it's yeah. probably going to be I wound up speaking of that. So I'm on the board of the Friends of Waterbury Reservoir. Okay. And we had folks from the Forest Parks and Recreation. And they were actually glad to hear about those signs being Mm -hmm. deploy because they know yeah people going, do going care on that road I mean, it, 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 it's like a bad out of hell <laughs> going up that road that's all i have okay last item is we just wanted to uh ask the board what's your pleasure on we we, we spoke about i don't know if this was before roger and Alyssa were no we were here. when we discussed the worcester cell yeah. towers yeah and granted that project kind of went went away but john kading who's on the worcester select board offered to have like kind of sit down with us you know it was just mentioned today mm -hmm. that, you know with the conservation commission they were concerned about that shootsville hill where we spent a, quite a bit of money and just if we want to have maybe a, you know a short conversation mm -hmm. just sir asking if you think that's a good you know it's not something that has to be tomorrow but you know at some point within the next few months what's your pleasure so do they still have a cell tower problem over there no they had a cell tower uh proposal. A, a proposal by verizon to put a cell tower there and there was much community opposition to the cell tower and it wound up being, you know, you know, he kind of asked me what we wound up doing when we had that problem in Shootsville Hill. And I was telling him about, and it kind of, you know, you know, we had a fairly protractive, you know, legal battle on what we won. You know, it kind of went, went away. So theirs just happened to go away. But, you know, like we all say, cell towers, they, they, Cellular companies want towers in different places, and it's going to be an ongoing, you know, issue. And where they're so, you know, no one wants a cell tower probably in well, their. They back, all want them, but not. That, the back everyone back. wants them when they when they when they need to, you know, you know. I go crazy going by Billings when there's there's no cell service, but uh, I figured it would be a good good conversation between the two communities. Sure. Well, go ahead. I'm yeah, I, I don't want to be. I'm I'm open to it in the spirit of neighborliness and wanting to be good, literal neighbors to communities. I guess I would ask if is there any potential? You know, candidly, the last request was asking us as a select board to write a letter against the public utility board commission, whatever it is at this point, which is not something I personally, as a board member, was ever going to support. And so, right. um, I don't want to do it. I am also where candidly we have pretty full agendas, including for the next couple of months right. with the municipal manager search, with our allocation and the like. So, if we have a gap in the agenda, I'm looking I'm, at somewhere I'm down I'm certainly the road. open to welcoming newcomers, but I would hate to see. Us. I just think we have pretty limited time together, a pretty healthy workload. I'd love to see us tackle the zoning on our side of the Worcesters. Um, so I, you know, I think if he wants to, be, and I would also just say, like, is there another regional forum? I know Steve is our rep to the right. regional planning district, and is there things? So again, I'm, I'm not opposed to it. You know, in general, like I know more town talks to us about things. That's where we want to be good neighbors, and so I would yeah. never want to flat out refuse. I'm just saying. Personally, looking ahead to the next couple of months, I I'm, think our board has a pretty healthy workload. I'm yeah, looking at know. down the road. The only reason is John's also, he's more than willing to come here, but their board meetings, I think, parallel ours. So he would just need some, you know, a good amount of lead time as well. So I'm thinking two, three months down the road, when, when we could fit it in if we had a slow, slow day. Right. Particularly if there's an imminent concern or action needed. No, there's nothing. I think it's just one of those good conversations that we never get to. 
Sergeant Long. Okay. So I got one other question for the board. Um, I've heard that our Vermont State Police Department public safety is having some staff issues. Um, and in lieu of a couple of shootings that have taken place here in town and uh, what seems to be a growing drug problem, uh, I didn't know if the board had any interest in having um, having a visit from uh, from the our deputy state's attorney to explain to us a little bit about what's happening on the other side of the state police department itself. In other words, what happens after arrests are made or, and talk about policies that are in place and, and things that are being done on the prosecution side that are either having some effect, no effect, you know, whatever effect that they're having that's either allowing this problem to continue to grow or policies in place that are policies that could be changed. Uh, just an all overall discussion about maybe the other side of the coin on uh, law enforcement that none of us have probably much knowledge about. Um, well, you're probably going to see with at least the deputy, the, the state's attorneys and stuff like that, maybe that deputy state's attorneys, but we're in a, a primary season and probably they're going to be busy with a lot of things until after the August primary, you know, maybe sometime. Well, actually, I, I, I've been in conversation with um, Bridget Grace and she's yeah. more than willing to come in and talk to us a little bit about it, if the board's willing to hear what she has to say. Um, What's your, oh, Alyssa? So I'm not asking to go first. I don't need to leave. I guess I have the same reaction to what I just said about the Worcester cell tower, which is right. I, I have no it. disagreement. I will say candidly, it is a contested election. It's primary season, so I'm just throwing that on the table. I guess my question is like, do we see us as what what do I see us doing with information we obtain from her? To be clear, I think it'd be hugely informative. I went to they did a um, substance abuse forum, the woman who came on open meeting one thing. I went and sat in this room for two and a half hours. We had folks in recovery, I felt like I learned a lot, so it was worth I'm not saying it's a bad use of our time. I'm saying of the select board meeting, I guess, would I see us changing any of our policies as a result? I also know we've had our trooper visit and reports on the agenda parking yeah. lot that we haven't gotten to. So personally, I feel like we should deal with what's in-house before inviting. So again, I'm not saying it's off the table, but for me, again, that next couple of months being healthy that would be my preference on where to go first. I wonder if uh, they could coincide, if that would, if there'd be any benefit to that. The Vermont State Troopers and oh, when the troopers give their yeah report, yeah. I don't know. It was just a thought. Uh, my cousin's death from fentanyl overdose and cocaine still bothers me and will bother me for ever, ever. A senseless useless death uh, and I I don't know I just feel compelled to try to look at options of what the what the board if anything can do to help curb this problem that's growing in every every town and every city in this country and uh, is worse than the COVID epidemic as far as I'm concerned. I understand your feeling, Chris, but I also, I, I hear what Alyssa's saying. And even if maybe something like this could be a separate select board meeting, you know. I'm just bringing it to you guys. If we want to do that, you know, spend, spend some time doing that. 
but I do agree on our Mondays, uh, first and third Mondays, we should concentrate on the tasks okay. being, you know, and maybe a few months down the road, we might have some time for some of this stuff. Mike, I'm, I'm curious yeah. if, if we can, um, you know, find some middle ground too of getting the, the troopers on the agenda since they have been, I think, in the parking lot a little bit. And, and even if we need to schedule out a month or so, just getting that on and knowing that they'll likely address this and or field our questions about it. And then Chris, I wonder if um, she might be willing to do something in writing so that we can at least as a board become more informed about what's going on, even if we're not quite ready to have her come into a meeting just yet. We've got the information, then we might be able to schedule down the line if we want to do something in person. So if that's something she'd be willing to, to do for us, you know, I think the, the more knowledge we have, the better. Sure. I'll certainly pass it on to her. Okay. Yes. That seemed like a reasonable. Yeah. I'd like to so know. On the, on the, on the, on the uh, parking lot, VSP reports, we try to do that fairly regularly. Um, that was for their monthly report. Yeah, that's what I said. Um, and it wasn't all that long ago the troopers were here. Right. Well, I haven't seen them that months ago. Yeah. Um, yeah, they were here. Four months, so it's okay. It goes yeah, back. They, no, I'm not I'm saying, saying that's what they say. They all. typically come once a year. Right, right, no, I'm not. Oh, okay. okay. They, don't, okay. they don't come um, all the time. They, you know, we can certainly invite them. Um, they've recently moved. They're in Berlin now. Um, and uh, I, well, the month just ended. I was going to say it's been a while since I've gotten a report. Um, on the, I just wonder if you invite the person that you're talking about right now, if you're going to get other people saying, you know, you should let the opposing people who are running right. come in and talk to you. So Politics. it might be a good thing to do, but it might be best to wait till after the election, after the November election, <coughs> and whoever is in office, because they're the ones who are going to be dealing with it, not right. somebody who's aspiring to be in office. So I, I just think that you might open yourself up to saying, hey, you know, if you're holding a candidate's form, I want to come in as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess that wasn't right. my intent. No, I know it wasn't your intent, <laughs> but, you know, we, we, had, yeah, we yeah. had to get the Democratic response just to the signage. Oh, event. yeah. So, you know, as soon as <laughs> yep. you start inviting somebody in who's running for an office, you're going to have other people saying, me too. So I think it's a good idea, but maybe you should wait until but there'd be no such concern just inviting the, the police in. No, no, the officers. Police, police is fine. And I think they could address that fentanyl issue. I'd right be on. interested to hear yeah. what they have to say about it. Sure. I can, I can reach out to them and see what they can come next. Thank you. Anything further to come before us? If not, motion to adjourn. I so move. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 And any opposed? Well, bye, Danny. <laughs> <laughs>